this workshop, uh, we wish on the one hand to map all the existing expertise and to identify good practices on what social impact is and how to measure it, uh, with a special emphasis on energy communities, but not only that. And on the other hand, to generate easily comprehensible informational material to communicate the, the project and the social impact to the target audiences. Uh, we, it will not only help us advance the, the research that, and the study that we are about to launch next year, to, that we would like to launch next year on the subject, but it will also be an occasion to create some additional prom material like um, uh, video extracts and short interviews that will help us to introduce and elaborate on the topic uh, in Greece and in Europe. And uh, I think this is, this is from me. Uh, I would like to give the floor also to uh, Stavrula Papa and Dimitris Kitsikopoulos. Stavrula Papa is a project coordinator, is a program coordinator at uh, Rescoop and Dimitris Kitsikopoulos, the co-founder co of Electra Energy. And, let, and after that, yes, after that, we can talk a little bit more about the practical uh, flow of the, of the day. Maybe I can start then. Um, great, thanks a lot, uh, Kiki, for the very nice uh, introduction. Um, yes, maybe I can also start by introducing myself. I'm Stavrila Papa, I'm an energy lawyer, and together with Antonia Proka, that you will meet in a while, we represent uh, Rescoop EU, which is the European Federation of Cities and Energy Cooperatives. Um, some words about our federation. Uh, we are a growing network of uh, about 2,000 uh, cooperatives around Europe, and they jointly represent over 1,250,000 European citizens. Um, and uh, maybe I can share some things about our activities and what we are doing. Uh, we are supporting both starting and established energy cooperatives and provide them with some tools and some networking opportunities with each other. And uh, we promote, of course, a cooperative business model in the energy sector. And uh, one of our core activities uh, is policy work that we're doing, and we represent the citizens and energy cooperatives to European policymakers. And uh, with that, we partner with the Community Power Coalition, which is a network of uh, NGOs and uh, organizations that work that represent energy cooperatives. Uh, and we try to promote the development of community energy around Europe. Um, we are also trying to lobby for a European legislation into this context of this advocacy work we're doing uh, for energy communities that is favorable for us and uh, that creates a level playing field for them to participate in the market. And I can say that already great win uh, has been the introduction uh, of uh, two definitions of energy communities at the EU level with a clean energy package the renewable energy communities and the cities and energy communities. And uh, at the moment, we are on the transposition phase and we are monitoring this transposition process in the different member states in order to make sure that uh, member states create a favorable legislation uh, for energy communities. And apart from our policy work is also to, to make sure that policymakers acknowledge the benefits that energy communities bring to the local energy system and to the society, of course. So um, as Kiki mentioned uh, in the introduction, some of the benefits are already measurable and uh, there's a lot of research behind it, but we lack some research on the socioeconomic impact. And we believe that it's very important to have elaborate mm -hmm. data on this topic and to use it in our policy work to persuade then the policymakers of the added value and the unique position for energy communities. Um, so that's, I'm, I'm really happy that we managed to have all of you today here to, to share your expertise and your views on the topic. Um, so yeah, then uh, I will pass it on to, to Dimitris. Hello. Uh... Hello, my name is Dimitris and um, I represent uh, Electra Energy. 
Um, as already mentioned by Kiki, uh, we are a, um, a social cooperative that was founded in uh, 2016, and we work exclusively on uh, developing the uh, community energy movement in Greece and supporting the community energy movement in Greece and supporting the development of energy communities in Greece, but also in some of our neighbor countries. Um, we work with municipalities, with SMEs, and most importantly with citizens. And um, in, in some of uh, the, the projects we develop, in some of the energy communities we support, we also participate as, as members, as, as physical persons, apart from supporting them with through uh, Electra. We want to be part of it and we want to be a member so to see from the inside uh, what are the, the challenges and what are the actual opportunities and what are the discussions. So one of the key questions that uh, we, we face uh, and we come across from uh, the members of uh, the energy communities is that uh, they are telling us that uh, we know that uh, what we do has uh, obviously some uh, economic uh, benefits uh, for us, but also for local societies. And it is something that uh, it is measurable. We also know that uh, the environmental benefits are also uh, easy to be measured, but this is something that uh, also other um, conventional uh, companies in the energy sector, in the renewable energy sector do, and this is something fantastic. But we feel that there is something more than that. Uh, there is something that has to do probably with uh, the way uh, we make decisions, the way we even we argue, the way we uh, care about each other and about the, the, the place and the, the way we raise money. Um, there is something more than that, that it is really hard to measure, obviously, but it is even hard to, to describe it when talking to, to other people that they are interested to join. So we are happy that uh, we are part of this uh, uh, project because uh, it will enable us, uh, first of all, to uh, produce some material and some uh, tools for the members of the energy communities in order to empower them and to be able to, to communicate uh, properly what they do with uh, outsiders. But also uh, it is important for, uh, for us when we talk to external stakeholders, when we design our, our advocacy activities, uh, we really hope that uh, we will be able to produce uh, some knowledge, uh, get some insights and uh, help us out with our activities. So this is why we are here today to explore that. And this is obviously just the beginning. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dimitris and Stavrula. And so uh, regarding the, the today's event, uh, this, is, uh, this is clear now, I guess, why we're doing this and we are gathered here today. Uh, Apart from that, we would like to, to note that this is also an opportunity for knowledge exchange, for, for raising concerns, for discussion. So we, we encourage you to, to use the chat and also to, to try to keep yourself within the time limit of 10 minutes in order to have time for questions in the end. We will also take uh, one question uh, after its presentation and also we will try our best to not leave any any question unanswered uh, when you when you, when you write it in the chat. Um, we will be sharing also some relevant information, further information in the chat. So feel free also to share more about projects that you are involved or articles that you have published uh, in the chat. And um, I think it it was mentioned also in the invitation you received that this is a recorded event. And we will be using the material after the after this event. Uh, I guess that you are here because you agree <laughs> with this uh, with this condition. So, uh, in preparation of this workshop, we have asked you for your contributions uh, through a questionnaire. And uh, Adonia Proca and Chris, uh, Chris Bretos attempted to systematize your responses in an introductory introductory presentation for our conversation. Uh, Antonia Proca works for uh, Rescoop EU, and uh, Chris Vertos is working as a community engagement and communications manager at Electra Energy Coop. So now the floor is yours to make this presentation. Great. Thank you very much, uh, Kiki. Thank you very much for the introduction, but also for the invitation to uh, collaborate on this uh, very exciting uh, project. 
I will share a presentation that uh, I have, uh, we have prepared actually uh, for this together with Chris. One second. I hope you see my presentation yes. uh, full screen. Mm -hmm. uh, excellent. Uh, so um, once again, uh, thank you very much. Uh, thanks to everyone who has been uh, supporting us uh, through this uh, first phase of the project uh, that we are uh, launching, let's say officially uh, today. Um, let me say that actually the issue of uh, impact, trying to understand the impact has been uh, very uh, crucial uh, also for me uh, personally. As Tavrila said, that I'm currently working for uh, Rescue PU, but before joining, I was also uh, doing a PhD, focusing on exactly the issue of impact of uh, renewable energy initiatives. Uh, how can we understand what this impact is in the context of broader systemic changes? Uh, and how can we support actually the in increase of this uh, impact? Um, in my research, I actually combined uh, transition theory uh, with a business model perspective, trying to understand how the different organizations create impact and how this impact can actually contribute to, let's say, a shift from one system to another, a change from uh, the dominant culture structures and practices, let's say, to new alternative, more sustainable culture structures and practices. Uh, this slide was from my uh, PhD presentation. Don't mind the reference to Kandinsky. <laughs> you can find more information about my uh, framework uh, also in follow-up uh, activities. I'm not going to spend too much time actually presenting my framework here, uh, but uh, what we're going to be doing uh, in the next uh, uh, slides, we tried, as um, Kiyaki mentioned, to systematize a little bit all the very, very useful and very enriching uh, input. Uh, to the research and I tried up to a certain extent to follow, let's say, this dimension that I have been using for my uh, research. So once again, thank you very much uh, for your uh, contributions. This has really uh, enriched uh, our, uh, the scope of uh, our uh, research and we are actually uh, very happy to have received input from uh, different, uh, from your different uh, specific backgrounds. Uh, some of you are uh, very ex experienced, apologies, uh, academics, but we also very much value the experience of uh, the energy communities uh, that have uh, supported us. Uh, so uh, let's start. Uh, some of the impacts uh, that um, uh, appeared in uh, the input that uh, you have uh, provided us with uh, relate to social impact, but somehow still connected to the technological side uh, of uh, the work of energy communities. Uh, one of the first things that uh, maybe also is discussed broadly is the support to uh, the uh, overall development of renewable energy technology, technologies, the increase of uh, acceptance of these technologies, and uh, the fact that through the involvement of uh, energy communities, the particular projects that are developed actually are more suitable, are in a, have a better fit, let's say, with the local uh, territory uh, specifics. And of course, through these uh, projects, we also see the security uh, of supply, uh, that this is something that is uh, guaranteed. Um, when it comes to the specific practices uh, of, uh, the, uh, of uh, uh, people, uh, let's say, involved in energy communities, uh, it has been uh, uh, recorded also in your uh, responses that um, when people join renewable uh, citizen energy communities, they actually change uh, their uh, practices. They increase their awareness in terms of uh, the cost uh, of uh, electricity, not only the financial cost, but also the more social environmental cost. So they um, become more conscious regarding uh, the consumption, their energy consumption. Uh, but this actually uh, shift does not only limit in the, is not only limited in the context of the energy. We have seen that uh, the people involved in energy communities actually get more um, sustainable, let's say, that we get more uh, interested in uh, other sustainable innovations. For instance, as you have also mentioned in your responses, we see that uh, some initiatives also, I mean, people involved in some initiatives also start uh, uh, participating uh, in uh, electric car sharing instead of driving uh, a known uh, private uh, diesel uh, car, for instance. Um, another 
dimension, let's say, another category of uh, different uh, impacts, social impacts, relate to the uh, knowledge base. So we uh, have also seen through your responses, this topic uh, is quite of an important one. Participation in uh, community energy initiatives uh, really enable uh, the support of, of uh, this um, um, educational, let's say, purposes, uh, capacity building, but also development of new skills. Um, and the increase, let's say, um, support for the development of the so-called prosumerism or uh, energy citizenship. Um, and then here we should also say that, of course, uh, this uh, impact, let's say, at the knowledge uh, level, it becomes even more uh, uh, amplified if we look at the topic uh, more like on the community level. We will discuss this later on. Uh, we have categorized this particular impact uh, under a, a different dimension. Uh, of course, uh, an important element uh, of uh, the impact of uh, community energy com uh, communities actually um, is the impact on the policy level and the political power that uh, these uh, initiatives actually uh, exercise. So we have also seen in your responses and we're very happy actually to underline the fact that uh, through the participation uh, of uh, citizens in energy communities, we have the support of uh, democratic processes uh, and the uh, increased, let's say, uh, participatory decision making, not only in the energy domain, but in some cases actually going beyond the energy uh, domain. Uh, through the participation in energy communities, uh, the involvement of citizens uh, in these uh, decision making processes uh, increases. And uh, we've also seen that overall the, the, the organization, the local organization of citizens also is something that uh, gets uh, higher. Uh, we have also recorded, uh, as you have mentioned, that uh, citizens actually, their, their, citizenships, uh, their citizenship becomes more vocal. Uh, so they participate more actively in the public uh, debate. And through this uh, active, uh, more vocal uh, citizenship, we see that uh, the impact on policies actually increases. And through this, of course, uh, maybe, yeah, I'm a little bit biased, but let's say still, of course, uh, the local policies uh, improve. Um, another level uh, that we see the social impact uh, of uh, energy communities is the level of um, the overall organizational logic or the, or the sector structure. Uh, with the participation of energy communities in the market, the, the diversity of uh, the actors in the field increases. And uh, um, of course, also the ownership of the energy production also shifts and becomes more diverse. Uh, what we also see is that then uh, new partnerships uh, are uh, being um, developed. Uh, I uh, use now the, let's say, the, the term of uh, these intrinsic values, but I don't want us to uh, have this debate in uh, strictly uh, academic uh, terms. This is just to say that in the next uh, slides, we have also some other uh, benefits, some other uh, social impacts that are uh, good uh, on uh, the, in their own uh, right, uh, on its own uh, sake. So uh, one... Um, level, let's say, of uh, this uh, socio uh, of these impacts are referred to socioeconomic uh, impacts. We've heard before uh, some of those uh, with the participant, I mean, energy communities uh, mobilize uh, private uh, credit uh, from uh, households and also with the development of new uh, energy projects, they actually uh, manage to redirect money that otherwise would be supporting the fossil fuel uh, system. Um, the energy communities have also uh, the ability to keep the financial resources within the local communities. Um, they uh, also contribute to uh, particular uh, tax revenues, which are actually then uh, reinvested uh, in uh, public goods, for instance, uh, with regards to community work, healthcare, education, natural restoration, uh, etc. An uh, important also impact uh, is the impact on the uh, individual consumer uh, bill. 
something that is also uh, happening and is important, especially in Hybis with all discussion about the uh, energy uh, prices. Uh, then uh, directly connected to this issue is the issue of uh, energy poverty, energy and fuel poverty, which is uh, an area that energy communities are also uh, involved. And later on, we will also hear more um, about the particular uh, topic. Uh, with uh, this, I will actually pass the virtual mic to Chris to continue. Thank you very much, Adonia, and for everyone for being here today. Uh, for the next few minutes, I'm just going to quickly map out the rest of the impacts that you helped us identify and close off the presentation with some challenges, opportunities and broader reflections about the social impacts of energy communities. So continuing, um, the energy communities contribute to job creation and increase the rate of employment, which is, of course, in turn, uh, in turn linked with um, socioeconomic regeneration of a local area, but also unlocking added value from land. For example, let's say through an agrivoltaic business model where you combine agricultural production with photovoltaics, so you make the most efficient use of a certain piece of land. Um, these groups can also increase territorial attractivity and livability, and of course also contribute to increased tourism. We see many times uh, tourists actually enjoy taking pictures, for example, of uh, landscapes with uh, wind turbines. Um, and of course, another interesting uh, point here is that through developing these new capacities, tools and skills within energy communities, these groups can then transfer those services to other contexts, both nationally and internationally, and contribute to uh, another source of income for the community or for, for the country in general. Um, and finally, since we're talking about kind of uh, scaling it out to the national level, we see that also through uh, the use of uh, national endowments, so for example, locally available renewable energy, this contributes steadily to the a reduction of um, in the dependence of imports, of energy imports of a country. Uh, another thing that we note is how energy communities can contribute to the connection of remote and off-grid communities. And as I mentioned before, they can support the investment in underdeveloped and peripheral, peripheral regions, which in turn is, of course, linked to a reduction in demographic decline of rural areas through the creation of local economic opportunities. Moving on to the sociocultural impacts, we see that energy communities can create a sense of identity and a sense of social cohesion. Of course, through participatory and direct democratic practices, they can contribute to social inclusion and provide support for vulnerable communities. They can also increase a community's autonomy and self-sufficiency through the, some of the examples that uh, Donia mentioned before, for example, by keeping uh, the revenue within a local community and reducing leakage. They also contribute to a community's resilience uh, Recording in progress. Shielding, the, shielding them from extreme weather phenomena and the energy price, um, market energy price fluctuations. And they broadly uh, contribute to community empowerment through the building up of trust, cooperation, and through a general culture of sharing. Just kind of moving a step back and looking at the broader societal impact, we also see that they can uh, uh, energy communities can also create health benefits, such as for ex for the example through the um, through the reduced air pollution or by establishing comfortable thermal regulation at the household level, which is of course is in turn linked with a broader increase in the quality of life. As someone who uh, has access to thermal comfort can then have a decent life and contribute more. Um, to, to public life and can be more active in their local community. Um, also, moving on to the social environmental impacts, of course, energy communities, by investing in renewable energy, they're directly contributing to the tackling climate change. And why is this social? Well, you know, there's all of this talk in international literature about the social cost of carbon and what will um, every uh, extra gram of carbon dioxide lead in terms of uh, reduced agricultural yields or increased healthcare costs and so on. So this is the social cost of carbon. And of course, they have an impact on nature. So they affect landscapes, ecosystems and uh, ecosystem services that are provided to local communities. Here we can have both negative and uh, positive impacts. We've chosen mostly to focus on positive impacts uh, in this presentation, but this is also something to reflect on later uh, through this workshop. 
So just very quickly, uh, uh, starting to wrap up the presentation here, I'm just going to say that I also did my master thesis on energy communities, looking at to what extent can they contribute to a new economic model, a post-growth economic model that prioritizes social and ecological goals over private profit. And I think it's extremely important that we are starting to have these discussions more and more. So what are these intangible benefits, as Dimitris uh, mentioned before, that energy communities can offer? For example, through prosumership, through energy citizenship, political participation and empowerment, education and shared vision formation, and broadly the formation of a new socioeconomic model. Because in the 21st century, we need to, to start having these nuanced discussions around um, sustainability and really try to use energy communities just as a starting point uh, and through them go deeper and deeper within our local communities and debate and have constructive dialogues around what it means to live sustainably, to feed yourself sustainably, to transport yourself sustainably, to clothe yourself sustainably, to start forming new community relations and, and, and mentalities. Um, so just uh, moving on to the challenges that uh, you helped us kind of identify through the questionnaire, we see that there's a lack of lack of capacity in many communities to gather data for uh, social impact indicators. And also there's a lack of time to engage with or operationalize all of these indicators. There's also many times scientifically a, a difficulty in establishing causality uh, for many of these impacts. And the, the next two, two points are linked. They're quite important because they, they, they actually present a, a significant hurdle for the operation, operationalization of um, social impact indicators in our work. It's that many times these uh, impacts take, take time to manifest and uh, they go well beyond the short uh, cycles of electoral uh, you know, elections and uh, policy creation. So it might be hard in terms of advocacy to persuade policymakers that, look, these are the impacts, this is the evidence. And all, also, it's important to note that for um, impacts to manifest over time, there needs to be a stable regulatory and legal framework. For example, a, a stable return on, invest, on investment based on power purchase agreements or feed-in tariff terms. Of course, uh, on a positive note, there's also some opportunities. For example, that we can work with local communities to co-develop and prioritize what are actually the most important identified social impacts within its respective context and its respective local community. Um, one uh, very interesting paper that one of you sent us is by Van der Waal, uh, 2020. I believe uh, the, the author of this paper will also be joining the workshop later today. Um, and another thing that uh, you pointed out in your reflections is how energy communities can actually expand their work in other sectors and provide positive knock-on benefits. So start building these interdisciplinary and intersectional coalitions with other actors, such as, for example, agricultural cooperatives, artistic cooperatives, political movements, to start, as I said before, negotiating a broader systemic change and not just pursue a siloed a single issue reformist approach. Of course, uh, it's important to note here, and we see the example through uh, RESCU being here, the European Federation of Energy Cooperatives, that energy communities can and should build uh, networks of mutual solidarity, both at the national level, but also at the international level. And through these partnerships, catalyze um, the transfer of knowledge, resources, and thus uh, increase uh, social and environmental impact even more. Finally, closing off, uh, just to uh, share some of the reflections that you pointed out through the questionnaires. First of all, all the rich literature around social impacts does not mean that necessarily we are going to be observing these impacts every time on the ground. Also, when we're talking about impacts, we have to be asking ourselves impacts for whom, who is left out of this process. And even within a community that you know, we're studying and we're measuring the impacts, we observe that there's an, a significant difference because usually it's only the people that are actually at the core of the team that are benefited from these, um, from these impacts. And whereas the outer circles of the community are not actually benefiting, for example, through in, increased skill learning or social learning or uh, uh, reduced economic bills or, or whatever, any, any of these things. Um, so the kind of the challenge for us moving forward as scholars and activists of community energy is to 
engage more with communities and get them to benefit from these impacts through this engagement. Uh, also linked to the previous point that the importance or the prioritization of an impact depends on who's asking. So um, a social impact might be more important for a researcher than a policymaker or for a community member itself. So we need to be cognizant about that as well. And we should always remain reflexive and critical on the impacts question. As we said before, there, there can be negative impacts, there can be no impacts, the impacts can depend on the context. So we should not take the impacts uh, question for granted. We should always remain reflexive and have a dialogue about that. And even monitor how impacts might develop within one specific community over time. So thank you very much. This was just kind of a quick summary of the very uh, enriching information that you sent us through the questionnaires. And we now would like to provide you with a space um, to hear directly from you, uh, from your research, from your lived experiences, for those of you that are actually part in energy cooperatives. And yeah, looking forward to hearing from all of you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Adonia and Chris, for this uh, wrap up of all the responses that we have received and the contributions and also your own uh, input is uh, in this presentation. And um, I think it is quite interesting and uh, nice um, that we chose to begin uh, with uh, Mr. Jeffrey Moxham from the International Cooperative Alliance, because it's, I, I feel it is linked to what you both mentioned about the cooperative model of uh, the cooperative business model of, of the communities and how they, are, they have this potential to uh, make this uh, transformation, this transition to a new socioeconomic model. At the same time, they need to be active in a very specific and very competitive uh, actor uh, field, the energy sector. So how uh, can all these be uh, linked to their social impact as well is, is one uh, question. Uh, Mr. Jeffrey Moxum is a research coordinator at the International Cooperative Alliance, and he has coordinated a number of research initiatives on international cooperative development, uh, including cooperative statistics, uh, cooperative law, and sustainable development. And um, I think also, um, well, welcome. Uh, I think you have a presentation to make also, right? Yeah, hi, welcome everyone. Uh, thank you so much for having me. I'm just wondering, you. can you see my, my slides? Yes, it works fine. Super, okay, that's great. Um, so allow me to, to kick off and, and thank you again for having me, um, really a pleasure. And uh, actually, can I just say also that the, the overview of the responses and the presentation that you just gave is already giving a really, really terrific picture of the specific impacts. And I will approach it more just generally from the perspective of, of, of cooperatives and their, and their specific identity. Um, so I'm, I'm working on research at the International Cooperative Alliance which for any of you who may not know, I mean, the, the ICA is a, it's a global membership and civil society organization for the representatives, the representation of, of cooperatives. So we aim to, to unite, promote and develop cooperatives. Um, and I mean, in terms of thinking about specifically from the perspective of social impacts, I will say that the ICA definitely doesn't have um, all the answers yet. But what I would like to do is just sort of give a more general view of, of co-op identity and, it, and its links to social impact. And I, what I will say is co-op founders wanted to achieve much more than, than just establishing and operating successful businesses. So they had a really strong concern for social justice from, from day one and, and a passion to also, to also transform people's lives. So I think we can already look at it from the, from the idea that the co-op movement has always been motivated by, by a concern for the, for the social, and at least those co-ops which you know, have committed to the identity and, and to the movement itself. And so what I would say is, is, is does the adherence to the cooperative values and principles equal more social impact? So we at the ICA would definitely say yes, uh, and the extent to which any measurement should be based on the values and principles is, is an open question. But um, ideally, any measurement framework if developed you know, by co-ops and for co-ops should take the co cooperative identity as, as a basis. 
So, I mean, this is because we have we have strong minimum standards, of course, and that's that's a great definitive strength of the co-op movement. And they are also internationalized. So I think when we look at this question of social impact, it's, it's also thinking about what's unique to co-ops as, as a basis for some indicators. And uh, that's why that I feel values and principles are quite quite um, useful to this discussion. So, I mean, values such as democracy, equality, solidarity, um, and ethical values such as social responsibility and, and caring for others, these are inherently linked to, to social impact. So, um, in terms of the, the, the values and principles, and I just think it can be useful to have a little look at the, the principles um, to tease out maybe a few hints about, about where maybe social impact measurement can go. Um, and I don't want to sort of repeat what's already been said because I, I agree with really very much of, of, of what's been said already. Um, the first is, is kind of voluntary and open membership. And here I think we can look very closely at the idea of inclusion. Um, it's a key word that's mentioned several times in, in, the, in the SDGs, Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, and an area such as such as youth and agenda. So essentially to look at, you know, the idea of no discrimination based on, on social characteristics. So, you know, representing the underrepresented and the disadvantaged. Um, so we can identify young people and, and the issue of gender equality as a focus, but not not exclusively, of course. So asking kind of what specific programs and policies can a cooperative implement that might enhance that um, is one of the most sort of potent uh, powers of that principle for thinking about thinking about social impacts. Um, then secondly, democratic member control. Co-ops, democratic organisations controlled by their members, they're actively participating in policies and decision making, and that is a structural feature of, of co-ops and a force for democracy within civil society itself. So that in itself is a, is a, is a social impact. And uh, we feel that you know, social impact is going to be facilitated by, by proper governance and proper process that provides transparency and accountability, um, but also, as it's been mentioned, a framework for trust within the enterprise. And this will have a corresponding ability you know, for a co-op to, to achieve its goals. So, so thinking about the idea of audit and an and adequate, proportionate, but also effective auditing practices are kind of necessary, I think, and we can kind of use this analogy of having, you know, an internal house in order before before having a real chance to properly um, measure the social impact of a, of a co-op. Um, thirdly, looking at the idea of member economic participation. Um, and here we can kind of focus on the idea of equity and also the use of capital, which is something that was really well highlighted in the slide on, on, on the socioeconomic impacts in, in the presentation already, already provided. Um, you know, examining the issue of capital and asking to, to what end is it, is, it, is it being used? I mean, an equity there is, is really a core value that's driving that, that process. Um, so, for example, having the equitable distribution of surplus to members. So, so I think measures of social impact can follow the money to identify, you know, where that's being applied. And although it might be viewed more as an economic indicator in the sense of it's applying a, a quantitative measure to the activities of positive social impact, um, we can take the example, for example, you know, in the financial sector, maybe looking at, you know, what percentage of a co-op's turnover is, is in the real economy, let's say, as opposed to something that's financialized or securitized on a balance sheet, is, is kind of going to provide us with a good understanding of the, of the unique impacts of, 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 a, of a cooperative from a social perspective. So examining the question of economic localization, examining how the surplus is reinvested. Um, the fourth, um, autonomy and independence, I'd link this very much to the, the enabling environment and the regulatory framework and, and, and essentially having a good understanding of that is, is going to, to, to facilitate a greater social impact, let's say. And I, and I think, you know, we've done some work looking at the, the legal frameworks at national level and, you know, states that have a strong recognition of the social benefit of cooperatives, for example, we might consider Italy or Portugal as, as good examples, generally have, you know, cooperatives with a, with a social edge that are, that are thriving and, and, and this enhances the overall social impact within the society. So a good understanding of that 
regulator environment will help us develop you know an understanding of kind of the cost benefit let's say of of, of also non non cooperation so so kind of what gaps are there in the in 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 uh, social and public service provision um and what potential negative social impacts could be could be met by by new cooperatives or, or cooperatives who are already um in in that space so much of this is 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 hampered by a lack of education from, from policymakers and governments and, and the public, which which leads quite nicely onto the fifth the fifth principle there: education, training, information. Um, and we can really look closely at kind of the educational activities within a co-op and, and and see how this element is integrated. Um, developing ways to understand a bit how the cooperative maybe educates its its, its current members, but also it's the next generation of members and 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 the wider public is is going to be quite helpful for thinking about social impact you know does a core have have social outreach activities does it train and upskill its members so you know both kind of internal and external factors there um moving to to principle six um looking at cooperation between corps something that's already been mentioned there already to what extent are we collaborating together where are these networks heading to what extent is there the principle of solidarity with other co-ops, um, developing leadership, vertical and, and horizontal integration, and, and what are we doing to kind of build a broader co-op movement? Because we, we very much recognize that the co-op movement has a social impact, we, we would argue that is greater than the, the traditional kind of corporate economy. So, so how well integrated can we be in a, in a wider cooperative structure and, and how, do, how to project that, that identity um, Finally, I'll touch on principle seven, um, which is really a key area for, for our work. I mean, we're focused quite heavily on, on international cooperative development. Um, is a, is a, you know, I think it's also really highly applicable to, to energy communities. And I think it's really best to, to look at what the cooperative here is doing, doing locally. And SDG targets and indicators are also quite key. So the ICA is doing some work on this, but I think there's there's way more that needs to be done. And I'm really interested to hear more um, other people's views on this, definitely. Um, and so I, I'd like to wrap up with just a few thoughts here um, that tie this a little bit together. I mean, the, the co-op itself really should decide what they would like to measure. And I think we have to consider that it's, you know, it can't sort of be overly burdensome, bureaucratic, and we have to we have to be realistic. And too many indicators there it will not be, be effective. So we, we we can focus perhaps on, on ones which which really highlight unique elements of, of a cooperative. Um, so there's quite a challenge there for kind of comparable and reliable indicators. Um, I don't have time to jump into specific examples today, uh, but if you are interested, and I'll put the link in the chat um, afterwards, you can you can visit um, corpsfordev.corp, which is um, we have an international partnership between the ICA and the, and the European Commission on um, raising the profile of cooperatives in, in international development. And within the framework of this, we've produced several research publications on, on co-op development um, issues such as transition to a green economy. Uh, including some some studies of energy cooperatives, um, looking at issues such as peace and conflict, and also uh, youth inclusion, and and um, sustainable and inclusive business models. So you can find some really good examples there of of, of other ways in, in which courts are acting towards social impact. And um, with this, I I would like to close. And, and and again, thank you for for having me and for for taking the time to listen today. Thank you. Thank you, Jeffrey, very much. Uh, I think that your uh, closing remark about being realistic, especially when you have all these day, daily things you need to do as a member of an energy cooperative to keep also the cooperative working, the team and the community engaged to be also productive. I think uh, being realistic and trying to choose uh, the indicators that will highlight your own work and your contribution is uh, very important. Thank you very much. And um, I don't know if, if there is a question uh, here for Jeffrey or otherwise we can continue and uh, take more questions in the end. I didn't see, uh, I think not. Okay, so then um, 
Thank you. And uh, we will proceed with Mr. Daniele Pazzi, who is an economist working at the Joint Research Center of the European Commission. And uh, welcome, uh, Daniele. Uh, I think that we are many, very much used to this evidence-based information that the G JRC is, is giving us. Uh, I think th this is all your, your contribution. You provide scientific support to the drafting, the implementation, the assessment of EU energy and climate policies with a special focus on uh, economic and social implications. So we look forward to hear from you about the social impact of energy communities. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for the introduction and thanks for the invitation to this uh, very interesting workshop. So I uh just i want to share some uh, some thoughts today with uh, with uh, you and all the rest of uh, the attendants on uh, a work we are uh, we are um, conducting now on energy communities and uh, energy poverty so we among all the impacts you highlighted in your uh, very nice introduction uh, summing up the survey results uh, so we focus on uh, the role of energy communities in uh, tackling energy poverty so we think that this deserves special attention and um, yes you can uh, switch the slide the um, the question is um, the question that moves our our research is uh, uh, how energy communities can alleviate energy poverty so of course they they have uh, as you as you already mentioned a great potential and there is a large policy interest and support uh, around uh, around them as a tool to energy poverty alleviation there are many ways in which they contribute to this uh, to this goal the most straightforward ones are the through economic benefits, so lower prices and tariffs, profits or dividends that can be reinvested in uh, energy poverty mitigation or uh, reduce consumption. But also, of course, uh, um, there are impacts uh, due to the social dimensions of uh, of energy communities. So through citizen engagement, increased participation, empowerment of uh, participants and uh, prosumers uh, that contributes, of course, to energy democracy. And um, this is just to name a few of the of the impacts that can have uh, an effect, a direct effect on uh, energy poverty. So but uh, <clears throat> we feel, of course, there are also a lot of uh, examples of uh, of energy communities that uh, um, that are currently and actually tackling energy poverty, and we have uh, some examples also in our uh, recent publication. So I shared uh, in the in the chat a few a few reference uh, um, reference uh, reports that we published in the last. Uh, two years on social innovation, energy communities, and uh, uh, and uh, we we found uh, several examples. Uh, however, um, we have also noticed that there is a contrasting and sometimes limited empirical evidence uh, that uh, uh, tend to consider the barriers uh, to this equation. So uh not necessarily an approach based on energy communities uh, lead to an alleviation of energy poverty so and uh, well we quote just a few a few of these uh, very recent studies for example hanke and colleagues 2021 that looks at renewable energy communities uh, and uh, their contribution to the, the states uh, sample of uh, more than 70 energy res renewable energy communities and they say that the current impact on uh, energy justice is uh, is very limited and the ones that are really contributing to it is um, to the to the most vulnerable groups of the of the population uh, is uh, an exception uh, the same, more or less, came out mm, from the results of the survey, which is not published yet, uh, of the Comets project. It is uh, a 
thing that most of you are familiar with, uh, with this uh, Horizon 2020 project on which we are, we are part of the, of the research consortium. And uh, the same, so while most of the survey uh, collective action initiatives uh, declared that they uh, uh, have among their objectives to target the most vulnerable citizens and consumers, uh, the concrete actions that they can undertake are very limited. Uh, so uh, I think that uh, um, there is a need of reflect a bit more on the nexus uh, between uh, energy communities and, uh, and energy poverty and tackling energy poverty. Because of course there are, uh, we, we feel that there are several barriers and challenges that need to be resolved. And uh, for instance, I just quote some of them. For example, the small size of uh, most of the initiatives can be a limiting factor um, also linked to the problems of uh, instability of legislation that uh, impede or hinder the scale up of the projects. But usually the lack of resources, the small size, sometimes uh, prevent uh, uh, energy communities to focus or to embrace also the most vulnerable groups of the population. There are problems linked to technology. Uh, energy poverty regards mainly building energy performance, so people that live in poorly efficient houses. And so communities that only focus on production and distribution of renewable energy can have a limited impact on the well-being of this person. So, uh, uh, but it's also about the business model of the, of the energy community. So, since most of the uh, financial schemes of uh, that uh, of the communities, uh, such as the cooperative, uh, include an initial investment to be part of the of the community, sometimes this is not affordable for the most uh, uh, vulnerable segment of the population and therefore so and there are many many others i mean also the fact that uh, energy poverty actually is a multi-faceted problem and is not uh, sometimes the vulnerability means that there are several layers of poverty that coexist uh, within the same group of people so and there are poverty traps so people sometimes they do not feel that the energy issue is the most pressing one because they have also linked problem of health they have problems of uh, unemployment margin marginal marginality in terms of social exclusion so sometimes they they do not uh, feel that one solution to their problem may come from joining an energy community for example so there is also a problem on on the side of uh, the citizen the most vulnerable ones in particular so this should so what we are doing now is try to reflect a bit on this we are publishing hopefully soon a report uh, on uh, on this issue uh, so we we welcome also the fact that there are specific horizon 2020 projects that are looking at these uh, at these um, issues for example power up or power poor i think that we will have also presentation afterwards on uh, on this uh, on this project so and there are for example power poor uh, specifically address the problem of access to capital for energy poor or energy poor people by promoting a crowdfunding uh, uh, crowdfunding mechanism to to finance energy communities so we to avoid the problem of access to capital to the to the poorest one um, and also power up for example called for uh, a, a more active role of the local public institutions in establishing this link between the energy community and the most vulnerable groups of the of the population so uh, the 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 mm, i think the policy implication here is that there need to be dedicated uh, policy policy intervention and initiatives that explicitly links poverty alleviation poverty mitigation and energy communities and also the projects 
must recognize energy poverty explicitly and take concrete action to address uh, address this issue the equation that uh, energy communities equal energy justice or alleviation of energy poverty uh, might be correct but there are many other factors that have to be added to to make it viable so that's uh, that's the main message thank you very much so i will not be able to stay until the end of the of, of the meeting of the workshop today so but of course uh, uh, get in touch with me for any for any question or discussion after also after the workshop in the next days Thanks. thank you thank you very much daniela we will definitely be in touch and i hope that uh, this will be an opportunity for you to be in touch with uh, other experts and uh, researchers on the topic so to uh, go forward with your own work as well and i really understand the point you made about energy poverty and how complex issue it is and uh, I'm really happy to report that in the national um, plan of Greece uh, to mitigate energy poverty, energy communities do play a role and they are mentioned there. So I, I think there is some understanding, but in uh, many uh, countries as well, there is, a, and among citizens and policymakers, it's not very easy to comprehend the, the whole phenomenon of energy poverty to, to start with. So thank you again. And, um, thank you. I think we can now proceed uh, with uh, our next speaker. Uh, welcome, uh, Mr. Matthias um, uh, Hisselmoller from the Drift uh, for Transitions Research Institute of the Erasmus University of Rotterdam. Um, your work I see, focuses on participation and the utilization of various knowledge sources in the transition to sustainable energy, food, cities, and water with the energy transition playing a lead role. Uh, I think that uh, we, you will bring us more into the, um, the civic empowerment of energy communities and their transformative effect when it comes to the energy landscape, uh, because uh, when we think about energy communities, what comes to mind is uh, this decentralized local energy generation. Um, uh, really looking forward to see what you have to, to add to the discussion today. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, yes, I have also. I'm also very interested to see what I have to, uh, to <laughs> contribute um, because um, yeah, I'm from the Netherlands, and um, maybe um, yeah, this this is my. I have two slides. Um, this is the positive slide, and then I have. Um, uh, I wanted to say something about negative impacts, um, and um, so. What is very relevant in my analysis also of these local uh, initiatives is that uh, they can contribute to addressing climate change in a way that the big energy companies cannot. I think that is the strongest point uh, and the strongest claim to make for um, citizen involvement in the energy transition, that they can offer something that others cannot. They can, they can solve the climate problem. And, um, now, the Netherlands, as you may know, uh, is a very small country in, the, in, in Europe, but uh, we are, when it comes to uh, energy, we are the, we have the last position as it comes to the share of renewables in the European Union. <laughs> so, uh, and this is already for quite a, a long period of 10 years. We are on the bottom of the, of the, of the ranking, right? Um, so we share a position, let's say we are even um, outmaneuvered, let's say, by countries like um, Serbia, um, by um, um, Bosnia-Herzegovina, and I would even say uh, that uh, Belarus is um, outcompeting us when it comes to the share of renewable energy. Now we have seen, um, and what is interesting in the Netherlands, and here I show you the, the latest uh, statistics that I found from our Central Bureau of Statistics. And what I want you to, I want to have you a, a good look here because it is relevant that we see the position of solar, the increase of solar, which is basically something that citizens do either in a private way to do it on their own rooftop or collectively with other citizens or 
uh, via a private company on uh, the roofs of uh, tenants, uh, flats, uh, uh, housing association, social housing projects. Uh, that is the, the poorer people. And <clears throat> what you see is that in the Netherlands, uh, the onshore wind, which is highly disputed uh, today because of the, the fact that people get ill from uh, wind turbines that are too close to their uh, bedrooms, um, that is uh, growing. Uh, that uh, everyone thinks that the, the offshore wind is uh, largest, but we see that offshore wind is actually uh, not growing very fast. It has grown over the last yeah last year, and then you see that solar has grown, has outcompeted uh, uh, offshore wind, and that it is about to outcompete. Uh, onshore wind. So solar is extremely relevant if we see that the Dutch energy transition is uh, uh, so backward uh, um, in, in comparison to other European countries. Then what would you expect from our government? You would expect our government to support the citizens to uh, organize uh, solar PV projects and to take the benefits from that. And we had some regulations we had some regulations that are very positive uh, for uh, solar, and that's also the reason that's increasing. So now I come to what is happening, and I also want your advice, and, and maybe I even want your support about this. Maybe we can, um, yeah, we can together make a little chocolate about what is happening. So the next slide, um, and I'm apologizing for the, the next slide, please. No, no next slide. Yeah, that is easy. Okay, and I'm apologizing for the Heinrich Böll Foundation because this is about Kafka. Uh, this is not about uh, Heinrich uh, Böll. Huh? Um, so, um, can you still hear me? I hear you very well. Yeah, yeah. If you if you wouldn't mind going a little bit more in the back, because yeah, but I have to. This I'm is much sorry, better. I'm sorry low vision i have also to read my own slide but i will try yes to do so um okay um forgive me um so no worries. we have our our prime minister and he was in in the climate conference in glasgow and he was uh, uh calling for action 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 like a union leader and in the meantime the government of the netherlands they decided to compensate the people all people including the rich and the poor people for this rapidly increasing gas uh, prices right so they decided to do this in a way that everyone will be compensated except the people with who are investing in solar and wind energy so this is so strange um, because you would expect then, for example and this is the technical side they do it through the um, decreasing the electricity tax but um, as um, people like Antonia also know very well that in the Netherlands um, your investment in solar PV panels is paid because you are exempted from paying electricity tax so I will not make it more technical but it's very weird if you want to do something for the gas price you can also say okay I'm going to uh, give people compensation through lowering the energy tax on natural gas this is not what they did. They looked very problematic. It's very complex. And then they said, we are going to do something with the electricity tax. And um, that means that over 1.5 million households, and I think it's even 2 million households, that is about 20% of the Dutch population will not have compensation for the gas price and the people who have done nothing for climate, they will have full compensation and partial compensation only for the people who have done something for climate. And then it's very strange to see that there is no, no one is talking about it in the politics. No Green Party, no Socialist Party, no one. And there is no media attention for it. Only the people from the RESCOPE, the Dutch RESCOPE organization, they have written a very technical, a very technocratic letter to the parliament to ask if they can at least alleviate the damage. 
And I'm wondering why this is, because I don't understand this. I would ask the question, um, how serious are we taking climate change? If we are doing this and we keep it secret for the public, so the public, and this is the negative issue, the public will have to experience that they will not get compensation if they have invested in solar PV panels. What should we do about it? And I would say that in the Netherlands, the contribution of citizens is also in the in the mainstream thinking of the political elite is always marginalized. So they will they will cheer for you, right? If you have a citizen initiative, and they will at the same time say the real thing is the offshore wind. They will not look into the statistics. The media and government, they are oriented toward the big, the big players only. I have just written, I have, a year ago, I wrote this report that um, big uh, uh, players first, uh, climate can wait. That is the, the way in the Netherlands we have structured the policy. And that is not good for the trust in policymaking and um, as, yeah, as you have yourself specified in the invitation for this meeting, that a good climate in which there is a supportive, uh, friendly environment for um, initiatives like this is uh, very important. Now, I would say also that this is worsened at the fact that we are acting in secrecy, that we have this surveillance capitalism in which public participation is very much discouraged. So actually, I'm very pessimist. I have been very optimist. I live in a neighborhood and uh, we will have a, a transition uh, toward and uh, uh, over 30% of the people are actively supported this. We will have a transition towards sustainable heating. Um, I was amongst those who took the initiative 10 years ago, but it is very, very difficult because the institutions are working against us. And I think that we should realize that um, uh, there are now European regulations. I think very much for the European Union that there are European uh, regulations that we can use even also to bring uh, the Dutch government to court if, if necessary, because the European Union has said that citizen initiatives should be able to compete. Now, at the level of the impact, to, to close with one other sentence, I don't know how this is in other countries, and I can talk much longer about this, but I will close. But in the Netherlands, we have these uh, rescope initiatives that um, are uh, in people who get paid for what they are doing. And here I see a conflict of interest because their low political profile, uh, the fact that they are not informing their memberships, that they are not taking political action has to do with the fact that they are paid by Dutch government. That's a very unhealthy situation. So this is something I would yeah, like to have your advice, maybe not now, maybe there is no time now, but I would ha have to discuss this in the Rescope organizations, because I think this is um, an impediment for the further uh, progress of the uh, community movement, at least in my country. Thank you very much. And I hope I've not too much discouraged uh, you with uh, Franz Kafka. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Uh, Hissel Moller. Um, I think that uh, in Greece, at least, uh, we can relate a lot about the, the issue of the autonomy of the cooperatives and how it, it relates to the development of the whole movement. Uh, because we had uh, we have this uh, uh, legacy of rather with uh, another opportunity. Uh, I don't see a question, uh, so I think that uh, and thank you for for keeping to the time as well. Uh, I think that we can uh, proceed with uh, um, Mr. Um, uh, I see the presentation of Harris Lucas. Yes. Um, so I think I'm missing my my notes. Harris Lucas, well, um, you're here. Okay, it's good to see you uh, again. Uh, uh, Harris is an associate professor at the School of Electrical and uh, Computer Engineering of the National Technical University of Athens, and he has a long expertise on um, uh, developing policy decision models in energy and environmental systems with uh, keeping the human dimension at the heart of the modeling processes. 
And he's also coordinator of the Power Pool project that was already mentioned uh, by uh, Daniele Pazzi, uh, an EU Horizon 2020 project that uh, tries to work in the field to lower energy poverty levels. And uh, I, th I will just give the floor to you because I think you will have uh, you, you will talk about it much better than me. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Kiaki, and to all participants for this very interesting discussion. I hope you can uh, hear me well and you can see my slides. So I would uh, I will try to say a few things about our current initiative, empowering energy poor citizens through joint energy initiatives. Is the full title of the project with the acronym Powerful. And it's a European uh, project. We are 14 partners from 11 countries. Uh, the emphasis is, though, in eight countries that we consider as countries of a high risk in terms of energy vulnerability and energy poverty. These countries are, of course, uh, uh, South countries like Greece, Spain, and Portugal, also Bulgaria, from Balkans, Croatia, then and then Latvia and, and Estonia from the Baltic countries. And then we have also some very important networks from uh, Germany, from uh, 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 Belgium, and uh, from uh, Luxembourg, a company that uh, creates the platform. And uh, for in Greece, we have two important uh, partners uh, in ZEB and uh, Sustainable City Network. And the, the main idea of our project is, first of all, to support energy poor citizens to implement energy efficiency measures and to participate in joint energy initiatives. Second, to facilitate uh, behavioral change in uh, energy usage and enable the uptake of energy efficient measures and, of course, promote energy community projects, as well as alternative financing schemes like crowdfunding. In general, we create energy poverty alleviation support schemes that we develop and implement in these eight pilot countries, as previously discussed. And the idea is uh, to support the gradual transition from an energy poor citizen towards an informed and later an active prosumer. Very difficult challenge, as also previously discussed. What are our means towards this effort? These are the tools, the Energy Poverty Mitigation Toolkit. We have developed and we use the Power Target Tool, which identifies energy poor citizens, the Power Act Tool, which enables them to understand their energy use, and the Fa Power Fund Tool that communicates innovative financing and joint energy initiatives. We have also an energy poverty guide which incorporates all these energy poverty mitigation actions into the sustainable energy climate and action plans. These toolkits can be utilized by energy poor citizens, public and national authorities, communities, cooperatives, and other stakeholders. So, how do we create, design the schemes, and implement? First, in each pilot country, energy poor households and citizens are identified, leveraging the knowledge of the local partners and the power target tool. Then, energy support programs are developed by our certified energy supporters. We uh, create a network of supporters which, will, which are directly engaged with energy poor citizens and assist them in planning, securing funding and implementing energy efficiency interventions. So our energy uh, supporters provide energy positions with tips and tricks to encourage behavioral change through the support of our Power Act tool and information on how to take part in innovative financing schemes through our Power Fund tool. Finally, we create local energy poverty alleviation offices in participating municipalities with the support of our second certified network, this of the energy mentors. The energy mentors are energy supporters with one plus. They can also provide support and expertise for the operation and creation of energy community and all cooperative with a clear, of course, 
activity, uh, the hampering energy poverty. The expected results are we aim to have an ecosystem of uh, uh, 1,000 plus energy supporters and metros trained and certified, more than 15 energy poverty alleviation offices, six national roadmap, uh, eight national roadmaps in eight uh, European countries, the case study countries, one European roadmap, and of course, this powerful alliance network to support the sustainability of our project results after its completion. The project is uh, already in its uh, second year of operation. We have increased more than 100 trained and certified energy supporter, supporters and mentors already. We have our next training webinar Tuesday, uh, 14th of December. Uh, we have initiated our home visits. Of course, the pandemic uh, creates difficulties. So with uh, all protections, necessary protections, uh, we try to proceed with uh, home visit in various municipalities in Greece, like in Kifisia, Messini, Zitsa, Suli, and Thessaloniki. We have already established three energy poverty alleviation offices in Messini, Zitsa, and Suli, and we have completed two info days in Kifisia and uh, Messini. You can see this screenshot of the announcement of the Energy Poverty Elevation Office in uh, Messini municipality. And uh, you can see here our energy supporters, we call them local heroes in action during their visit in households and through the use of our tools and other uh, uh, measures and uh, uh, techniques like thermocameras. And you can see two uh, screenshots of uh, citizen assemblies empowering joint energy initiatives in the municipality of Messini and the municipality of Kifisia. For instance, the municipality of Kifisia, an energy community, Attica region energy community was established and we are, we, are, we are really glad that we support them in this respect. And here you can see our social media accounts as well as our website where you can find all respective information. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, um, Harry. And it's really nice to hear more about the project and how you take the energy poverty and energy communities together at the local level uh, with uh, your approach to to the municipalities and the citizens uh, themselves and not only the citizens but also all the, the people that are inter interested to become the energy supporter and uh, mentors. Um, we will now uh, welcome uh, three members of energy cooperatives of initiatives and uh, to hear would like to hear more from your perspectives on the social impact of energy communities and any practical solution or any concern and challenge that you have faced in the in your attempts to measure it. Uh, we will start uh, from um, uh, Spain with uh, Mr. Oiter Eitzhebaria Guterres, I, I think I said it correctly, uh, who is working in Goyener Group uh, and being part of the team that uh, that is helping for the moment nine municipalities to create renewable energy communities that will have in the DNA the aim to include vulnerable citizens. So here again, we see the lingot between energy communities and uh, tackling energy poverty or at least providing support for the most uh, vulnerable ones. Uh, so I think you have a presentation and you will be uh, handling the, the slides, right? Yes, and thank you very much for inviting me to this event. Uh, I'm feeling lucky because uh, it was Power Poor before, and we are also part of the Power Poor project. And um, we are, as you said, developing uh, renewable energy communities uh, by Goyener in nine different locations. Hernan is a 20,000 uh, inhabitants uh, village here in the Basque Country. And as uh, it has to be, we need to include the energy poverty people in these communities. So we have developed um, um, a cooperative, um, a model where we want to include them and we are trying to include them. Okay. And I will 
uh, explain how we are trying to do it. Uh, this is what our energy, uh, renewable energy co uh, community is. I think I'm not going to take time to explain this because everybody knows what the directive says. And uh, I will go directly to what kind of cooperative we are thinking about to assure that uh, energy poverty people is included. We are thinking about five different uh, memberships, member types in these cooperatives. Uh, starting with the consumers, and this is where the power has to be. And uh, natural people, small companies, medium companies, uh, organizations, associations has to be this kind of uh, consumers. We are also thinking about service providers, uh, usually small companies or medium companies that want to give uh, services to this cooperative. We are also thinking about collaborators, and the collaborators is most is very well, um, uh, it fits very well for uh, local institutions because uh, there is a law in Spain that doesn't allow local institutions to contract services with anyone they want. They have to, um, uh, they, they cannot choose one. They have to uh, get different uh, uh, different options and the, the best option is the one that will be choose, chosen. So uh, the, the, the local institutions will be a collaborator. We think they can be a collaborator and they have to be a collaborator because they have groups, they have uh, knowledge, they have contacts, they have uh, uh, confidence, confidence from the, the people from that village that uh, uh, they trust in the local institution. So we think that is a good uh, option for the local institutions to be a member as a collaborator. And we are also thinking about investors because there can be uh, uh, people or even, or companies or big companies uh, located in the, in, the, in, in, the in, in this village that will have money, but will have difficulties to get benefits from the from the cooperatives so investors uh, will be also uh, uh, welcome and also sooner or later this cooperative will have um, will, will have um, workers so we also think about the the members as a as a worker uh, the ownership the power of the cooperative has to be in the consumers uh, at least 51% and the rest of the power has to be uh, shared by the others. And the entership, the enter, the uh, enter membership fee, the entrance fee for the uh, uh, for the members has to be at least for the consumers very, very, very cheap, very easy to to go in. So we are thinking about like something like ten euros or for the rest more. Uh, not for the workers, or maybe not for the service provider, but at least for the collaborator and the investor, can be more, but uh, not for the consumers. Uh, when we are thinking about uh, energy cooperatives, we are thinking about many different uh, options for um, to to be implemented. Um, mostly regarding the po uh, energy poverty people. We will include them in the self consumptions, but mostly not only for them, but for everybody. Energy efficiency, um, um, making the buildings more efficient, and these kind of things is, are going to be very, very important. The way we are thinking about the finance of the cooperative uh, is. Uh, this uh, proposal, and in, in every place they have to think about this, but there is a, an uh, entrance fee, the membership fee, and also the voluntarily, voluntarily added capital that can be by the consumers, the collaborator, and also the investor. So with this uh, capital, we will be able to start doing different projects. And if there is not enough uh, finance inside the cooperative, we will need to go to the market for ethical banks or different other um, uh, organizations that will be able to give us the finance we need. 
and the way we are going to support to, to make the cooperative uh, sustainable during the time is uh, not about uh, fixed uh, fees for each member, but uh, percent, percentage of the savings they are going to get, to get from the projects that the, the cooperative is going to do. If there is a project where a consumer is going to save 100 euros per year, we will, we will have to ask that consumer to give back part of that saving, of part of those savings to the cooperative so that the cooperative has uh, money incomes, not only uh, spendings. And uh, we think, of, uh, Boyener thinks that uh, we can help creating cooperative, uh, creating this kind of communities because we know how to, how to create cooperatives. We know about energy projects and we know uh, uh, working with people. We know uh, how, how to work with people. And we are involved in nine different uh, municipalities, uh, but the most uh, advanced, the more, the, the, where we are going, uh, we already started, or we are going to start already the cooperative is uh, Oresha and Hernani, but there are seven more where we are working with. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think it's really, it, it is very uh, well linked with the previous uh, presentation of the PowerPool project. And I see that it is also very interesting how uh, you make the plan all, uh, all uh, to, to have the, the in, inflow of uh, revenues of, of money, let's say, let's put it bluntly, through the savings. So the focus is also mostly on energy efficiency, I see. And this is also the, the major thing that uh, can really help us tackle energy poverty and keep these vulnerable people out of this uh, circle of uh, energy poverty. Um, I don't know Thank if there are, there are any other if there are questions. I don't see something in the chat. So, um, well, thank you very much, and we will be definitely be in touch. So we will not um, uh, go very far, very very far away from Spain. We will move a little bit uh, next to Italy uh, to Miss Chiara Brogi if I say it correctly, and the National Energy Cooperative uh, in Nostra, welcome. Uh, Hi, everybody. I see you're working in the energy community team, so you help develop and activate the team throughout the different territories by studying their, your, their needs, their raising awareness, and involving all the people in the project. Um, uh, so let's hear from yeah. you. Your, your, uh, I will share my screen. Okay. Can you see? Yes, it works fine. Perfect. So a little bit about Enostra. Uh, as um, you were saying before, we are a national energy cooperative based on active participation and involvement of energy citizens. And what we do is uh, to provide our members renewable um, energy, and we produce uh, renewable energy um, thanks to our members that invest on collective power plants. We also provide services um, for energy savings, uh, and we um, do have like um, activities to inform and form um, the community around uh, energy, the theme of energy, and also, for example, we have some workshop with vulnerable consumers to, to raise awareness about energy and tackling energy poverty. And the last activity is the activation of renewable energy communities that we were talking about. So the social impacts, well, uh, we also, of course, have social impacts in the Nostra, in the cooperative. Uh, what I was thinking about to share is um, what we have achieved in the participation process that we are uh, doing right now in our cooperative. So we, we could see that um, through the activation of our members inside the cooperative, we uh, 
they uh, build uh, shared networks with other organization that goes beyond energy. So this theme always come back that energy can be a pretext to, to work also on something else like a, such as human rights or peace or sustainability. So um, our active members, uh, let's say are like uh, antennas for a change that comes from below. And it's not only like to, they, their role in the cooperative is not only to promote the Nostra as a energy provider, but also like to share to, to sensibilize around uh, energy and also other teams, uh, themes. And um, we are also planning to um, promote a call for ideas for our active members. So we will give them money to, uh, in order to help them with some initiatives that can develop on their territory for their community. And uh, relating to energy community, so Nostra is also, as I was saying before, uh, developing energy communities around Italy. Uh, and what we um, notice is that uh, by developing them and activating them on a small portion of, of a territory, uh, we can create also a win-win relationship among the different stakeholders that um, are working towards the same objective. So for example, a municipality and uh, the citizens, municipality is always seen as something very far away from the people like an institution. Uh, whereas with this kind of projects, um, the distance becomes more closer. Uh, and, and yes, the, the, there is less distance between the, the two. Um, also, uh, we are uh, working for, uh, so we, we develop an energy community in Villanova Forru, uh, which is in Sardinia, in the south of, of Sardinia. And uh, the, the community will receive uh, an economic benefit uh, from the state. And uh, this economic benefit, part of it will be redistributed among the members, but part of the benefit will be allocated for a project that will benefit not only the community, uh, the energy community, but also the whole municipality. So in this way, we can um, promote shared benefit uh, instead of for only one portion of the municipality. And uh, in Bikari, uh, we are developing another one, another energy community. And in this case, the municipality that is investing to, to develop it, uh, decided to invest on a power plant, PV power plant on public housing in order to mitigate energy poverty. poverty. Um, and this brings me to uh, what I was wanted to talk about and maybe the challenge we are facing is that we need an objective criteria to um, identify vulnerable, vulnerable consumers in order to mitigate energy poverty. So especially uh, in Italy, we cannot take uh, the equivalent economic status to, to identify these people uh, because we have a lot of also shadow economy, uh, but we need to develop something uh, more complex that um, can uh, include different dimensions. So it's not only about money, but it's also about cultural uh, behaviors and, and also how to approach energy um, and the and energy savings. So um, in order to uh, come to an objective like, such as to mitigate energy poverty, we, we have to, um, before anything else, uh, start to think how to identify objectively these uh, vulnerable consumers. So this is something, uh, yeah, just to, to think about. And um, yeah, so this is, this is it. If you have any questions or I will, yeah, I'm here to answer it. Okay, thank you very much, Kara, and it was very interesting uh, presentation right uh, on the, on to the point. Um, 
from my perspective, uh, within the network of our offices, we have an office in France and they are also having some regional work doing, uh, having to do with Italy. Uh, they are working on energy communities and energy poverty. So uh, I, I suggest that I can uh, give you a contact there and maybe they can also uh, facilitate your efforts as well and support yes. you. Thank you very much. I see a question, one approach from uh, Anna Berka in the chat. One approach I have seen used to identify vulnerable communities is using okay, health hospitalization data for respiratory symptoms. Okay, just a suggestion. Okay. It's a comment. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. Yeah, let's say specific small areas. We already found them by, uh, let's say, the municipalities knows where mm -hmm. the vulnerable consumers are. So that's that's yeah, a that's the key point, because they are much closer to yes. them and they yes. may offer also support on other issues, uh, yeah. like medicine or other other amenities. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you very much. And um, we will have a, a slight change in the in the program uh, in the in the agenda. Uh, we will uh, go uh, next to Mr. Nikos uh, Hadziergiriu. Uh, who is a professor in power systems at the Electrical and Computer Engineering School of the National Technical University of Athens. And um, he holds extensive research experience on smart grids, microgrids, distributed and renewable energy sources and power system security. He also served as chairman and CEO of the Hellenic Distribution Network Operator, as well as an executive vice chair and deputy CEO of the Public Power Corporation. So I think... Uh, uh, some of your part of your presentation, apart from social impact, will also uh, relate to your uh, experience and your work with the grids, I guess. Uh, thank, thank you, you for much. being here today. Let me share my screen. Mm -hmm. Okay, we indeed, see it. It's perfect. And indeed, uh, what I'm going to show you is also some technical aspects, which I believe also have a very high social impact. So the, the basic, uh, perhaps, uh, component of uh, um, our, uh, the, of the energy transition is the distributed energy resources. Distributed energy resources is the new element in the power system that has changed its structure because it provides a number of benefits economic benefits, environmental benefits, and technical benefits. <clears throat> so the use of small distributed resources, distributed generation, because the consumer is important for the consumer, the micro source, the owner, and the DSO, or the prosumer in general, and the DSO as well, the distribution system operator. And these benefits, as I said, are first of all environmental benefits, because these sources are based mainly on renewables or very uh, high efficiency, Machines. They have a number of technical benefits because they can be used for peak load saving, for voltage regulation, for energy loss reduction, for better reliability. We said all these also have impacts on the, on the social aspect and the economic benefits. Economic benefits because they provide uh, network hedging, which means they can postpone investments in the distribution uh, infrastructure that also is paid by the consumers. They provide a value of aggregation in platforms, and they also have value of local market. So local energy communities, according to their definition, are in fact uh, uh, associations or uh, cooperatives or partnership of uh, uh, local stakeholders, of consumers that are involved in distributed generation. And they also perform functions, they can perform functions of the distribution system operator and supplier. So they, in fact, are the ideal uh, organization to uh, combine and get benefit from all these uh, uh, aspects of uh, benefits that the DR produce. Um, as an example, let me, uh, we as a, as a technical university, we have uh, studied the various benefits that I described before and have proven most of them in several cases. I think a very important aspect is the involvement of energy communities in the local energy markets. So energy communities can control and coordinate 
they are in local energy markets where members can trade their excess energy. And this development of local energy markets can provide tangible economic benefits for all participants, not only the, the partners of the energy community, but also in general, the consumers. And uh, the extent of these benefits uh, depends on the relative size, of course, of the capacity of the DG and the general consumption of the members. So in this uh, recent study, we have shown that uh, in this type of local markets, uh, we can, have, uh, we can uh, provide more than 10% annual benefit compared to the, uh, to the business as usual case of the local energy community. I mean, when you compare the collaboration of uh, citizens in energy community and how they trade their uh, surplus energy to the market compared to the individual selling of energy by individual prosumers, we can have a much higher annual benefits as a community. And this is increasing much more if we also use the local flexibility. When citizens use the, they can shift their energy to uh, optimize the whole uh, economics of the energy community. And in the left uh, part of the slide, you can see some a complicated graph that shows for this particular case, what is the uh, consumption, which is the, uh, this uh, line, the <coughs> orange line, the green line for the generation, and then the power that is exported and important and the flexibility activated. And all this shows how the uh, trading the electricity as a energy community can provide all these uh, economic uh, benefits that I said before. And uh, in fact, uh, also we, as group, we, as Smart Roo, which is uh, the research unit of NTUA that is uh, working on smart grids and uh, also is involved in uh, energy communities, uh, in the technical aspect of technical communities. We have uh, developed a, methodol a methodology on how we can develop energy communities. And in fact, we recognize that the socioeconomic aspects are extremely important in this uh, uh, approach. So one of the four basic criteria are the socioeconomic patterns, the regulatory framework, and the community energy realities, let's say, the technical status of the local energy system, and the views of the citizens' engagement. So in the socioeconomic patterns, we have uh, looked at the demographics, economic structure, spatial morphology and res potential and then res potential and the cultural, social, built and natural environment. We have to check the regulation and the community realities, which means uh, how the legislation, the legal aspects, the legal framework of European and national conditions are, the relevant policies and uh, also the national regional targets for renewable integration. From a technical point of view, we need to look, of course, at the energy profiling, how electricity, transportation, heating, and cooling are, uh, formula, are uh, expressed, the hosting capacity of distribution network, and the spatial analysis of the renewables. And then, regarding citizens, and this has been achieved through various questionnaires to see the attitudes of the local population, measuring the energy transition, energy communities. And to see also how citizens can invest in this type of projects and, the, uh, and, the, and their wish to be engaged. And uh, taking stock of the social, economic, environmental, and regulatory the energy realities of the area, we can define scenarios of renewable penetration and assess the impacts of the energy community's uh, uh, traditional, uh, transitional path. And uh, in the interest of time, I will just uh, give you an example of a study that has been uh, done uh, for the European Climate Foundation in collaboration with Greenpeace. And in this study, uh, Smart Roo has provided an analysis scenario roadmap for Corfu and Zakynthos. These are two islands in the Ionian Sea, the connected islands in the Ionian Sea. And for instance, focusing on Corfu, you can see the analysis on the left column that uh, has identified an aging population, low energy efficiency, increased energy demand and energy poverty, 
low rates of higher education, impact on community energy projects engagement. Uh, we see that the tertiary sector, and especially tourism, is developed and has an impact on the electricity consumption profile. On the, on the graph on the right hand side, you can see on the middle, you can see the 2019 uh, energy uh, consumption. Um, you see that obviously during June, July, August, September, it is increased. And this also coincides with the arrival of uh, planes in the airport. Uh, you can also, regarding the analysis again of the um, general context in Corfu, you can see that the majority is economically inactive, that has an impact on social invested capital. Uh, on the other hand, you see a good solar energy potential. Wind potential is not very good. And uh, land availability and building stock for PV projects. We can see a large number of SMEs that are active in the tourist sector. Uh, regarding the citizen engagement and views, again, through a survey, has been identified they are not feeling involved in decisions, they are not very informed about energy communities, and uh, the estimated of total possible social, social invested capital is 23 to 26 uh, uh, million euros. And the test, technical status of electric energy is an interconnected system, as I said. And uh, based on this uh, uh, data, and also taking into account the energy transition goals from the uh, national plan of 64% renewables, forecasting the electricity demand by 2030, that is an increase by 14.5%. We have built a number of scenarios for renewable project investments, two scenarios with solar and wind projects. We have calculated the economic gains for the local system, business as usual versus community energy, community energy business models, stakeholders, and SWOT analysis. And uh, so this is uh, an example of how you can uh, define policy recommendations and provide roadmaps for the development of energy communities in various uh, Parts of uh, various parts of, of Greece and general. So that concludes my presentation. And uh, thank, thank you. Very you. Much. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Hadzir Giriu. Um, I hope you, you you will stick to the till the end because I think that uh, there may be some questions for you, unless you have another uh, another obligation. I can stay for a bit longer, please. Okay, thank you, thank you, that's great. So um, we'll go a little bit back uh, to discuss a little bit with uh, Mr. Dorian uh, Litvin, if I say again the name correctly, who is an independent consultant and researcher at ISEA. Uh, he's, um, he focuses on behavioral and participative approaches in energy and building. And uh, I see Dorian that you're also a member of the French Network for Citizens, uh, Citizen Energy Community, Energy Patarzi, uh, oh. <laughs> so I, I think we will hear more on the French perspective on social impact of uh, citizen renewable energy. Uh, uh, so the floor is yours. Thank okay. you. Do, do, do you hear me well? Is the yes. sound okay? Yes, the sound, and also we see the presentation very well. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, yes, so I, I, I haven't been able to participate to the, the other presentation before. I was presenting something here, um, so I'm sorry. Um, I couldn't hear all of, all of your presentations, so I'm really <laughs> arriving on the top <laughs> uh, without a, a picture of what you told, what you have been talking before. So um, yes, as, as uh, to tell you, I'm a researcher, I'm a PhD in economics, but I'm independent. I'm not linked to any lab for the moment, but I'm, do, I'm conducting some independent research uh, on behavioral and participatory approaches in energy and building. And um, yes, I'm a member of the Energy Partage, who is really in the network for citizen energy uh, communities here in France. Um, I will 
I will give you only some some points because I haven't been able to really make a good presentation. I, mean, I was I was it was a surprise for me to present today. So yes, I mean one, one week ago it was a surprise. I mean so I'm I'm giving some some insights, some points uh, from my from my point of view. So um, here are some examples of the social impacts and innovations from my point of view. Uh, some some of some of them. I mean. Of course, there are potentially a lot, but some of them could be that. The, uh, for the first one is about bandwagon effects. Um, I couldn't find another word now uh, more specific for that, but you know how a, a project, how a citizen-based project can in renewable energies can um, uh, can give a dynamic for all the projects or in energy, of course, but also uh, projects that have a public interest that are not not only energy but yeah that's the first point how do they spread the, the dynamic uh, to other projects and uh, there is also the, the point of the appropriation of the energy issue by citizens oh sorry i have some french words french words because <laughs> i'm not talking i'm not speaking english for now for a long time uh, so perhaps you can we will find some french words i hope you you will understand them um so um so how citizens they appropriate the energy issue they understand the energy issue uh, is the energy mine is the energy from the community uh, who who are the actors actors of uh, of the energy uh, system and so and so so this is of course a, a, a point that is interesting that is a potential impact we have also the incentives for energy savings we know that it's, this this is something that is very known how uh, this, this kind of projects can uh, uh, provide the information and sensitive and incentive to 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 make some energy savings and change the behavior behavioral change um you you can you, you can also we can here in france we, we talk about how uh, this kind of communities change the relationships to savings money savings i mean uh, that is also something that can one of the impacts how i consider the the saving the money my, my where i put my money and what my money is useful for and all this kind of uh, thematics uh, we, of course another one is the professionalization and the upgrade skills of beneficiaries and of all the the people who are um, taking take are participating in the in the in the project so we we, we found this in france uh, some some organizations, some associations, some communities really upgrade their skills and uh, and they start to really uh, make um, and also increase the professionalization, the ca capacity to really uh, sell a service. Um, there are also a point that is for me very important is how they the people involved in this kind of projects they experiment uh, new uh, new methods for governance and for decision making and uh, of course the shared decision making uh, how to share how to decide together uh, how to how to be listened in a in a meeting or in a or in a, in, a, in a workshop and how do we decide together and this is really i think very important and this is something that we could uh, uh, we could observe this where um, territorial um, uh, local i mean uh, local authorities they really increase their capacity to uh, to um, make decisions together for all the projects also um, and uh, one point that is for me quite important is about social and direct democracy and uh, I, this is not something that we really measure. There's not, there are no measure for the moment for that. But we can see that in the in the count in the villages or the cities where some these kind of projects are de developed, uh, we you can see that the democracy is a little bit more active, and people are really more uh, a little bit more uh, implicated in the local local uh, matters and subjects topics uh, of the of the community. Uh, so uh, here are some points of the hot topic in France, how this topic is important in France now, from my point of view, because I don't know everything on, in France, but uh, I, this is, these are the points that I, I could uh, gather it for you. And uh, so this is the news, I mean. So the news, the French one, is that the French Ministry for Ecological Transition just have just published uh, 10, re 10 recommendations for the development of uh, renewable energy uh, communities projects with here in france we call they call this with local governance with local decision making and it was the things of november so the french ministry is 
I mean, is showing that uh, a bit more that they are really uh, supporting this kind of projects. Uh, Energy Partage, who is the network of these communities, launched uh, his lab, the label for citizen projects. Uh, and uh, there are, uh, the 8th of November, we have the Assise de l'Energie Citoyenne, means a big meeting, the meeting for the, the citizen energy. Um, and also, uh, Energy Partage is running a survey, a study, I mean, uh, on the topic, but is uh, is a part of the topic, not all the topic, but I think that soon we will be able to provide uh, some results. Um, so, from my point of view, well, me on my my work and in my work, I also uh, engage some actions on this on the, on these topics. We built two action research projects for the ADEM and for the European uh, European um, H twenty twenty. Uh, with uh, Energy Partage and Rescop, and so we haven't been able to be selected, but we really improved the methodology, we improved the, the, the links between the, 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 the stakeholders, so we have this, this kind of, yes, capital, the, the capacity to, to, to work in, in projects with the, sub, the topic. Uh, uh, we run, I run a qualitative field study also uh, among all the, the project holders, federation, the structures who which are supporting this pro, this kind of projects so it was a qualitative field study this this qualitative study uh, helped us to uh, create build a grid of indicators and we we uh, how can i say we uh, improved this grid uh, through a, a participative a participative process some workshops with the people from the ground from the from the from the field okay and we also just published now uh, a small article, synthetic article, uh, that is uh, in a, um, a journal that is called Actu Environment about environment. That is a well, well, I mean, very known, uh, uh, how do I say, article here in France on the internet, a web, web, uh, web uh, journal, and it's called about wrecked projects with local governance. What are the real benefits for the territory? So we, in this paper, we say, okay, these kinds of, these, these kinds of, of uh, projects, they are really uh, known now, they are supported, they, they have real, uh, an importance in the energy transition, but there are no evaluation, really a strong evaluation of this kind of projects, and we need to do that. We need to evaluate the social impact of these projects. So that's why more or less what we said in this paper. Uh, and we are writing a methodological paper also on the topic. To, to provide some ideas of how we can lead a such a social impact evaluation. What are the main challenges for this kind of evaluations? Uh, from my point of view, some concepts are very hard to measure. We know that we cannot measure everything. Uh, everything is not measurable, but we, we can try and we can do the best we can. And I think we can measure a lot of things. We can also measure the it's not only quantitative aspects, but we can measure before and after. We can measure uh, uh, I mean, a citizen projects uh, and a conventional projects, renewable energy projects, and we can compare them and how they if they um, how they um, they change in time. So you know the cross the cross uh, methodology for experimental design with crossing within subjects analysis with between subjects analysis. So we can do this kind of stuff. And um, we need another problem that's, uh, you know, projects, renewable projects are very long. Some, some of them are long, so it's a, a kind of issue uh, how we can make an evaluation with projects who, uh, who uh, during three, four, five years. So, I mean, in France, some projects are very long to, to be able to, to uh, emerge on the ground in the, in the field. Um, yes, and one more. Um, there is the problem of the context effects, how the context effects, they really influence the, the project and how the project influence the context effect. And sometimes it's very wide. Uh, all, the, all the factors are very wide on the, on, on the ground. So this is a very, I mean, an issue. And how do we encourage the participation of the project managers and the project holders that are already overworked, overloaded? So it's also a point of uh, a problem. Uh, last, I mean, the last, last, uh, last um, slide. Uh, yes, I told you about um, how do we can we cross qualitative, quantitative, participatory, and experimental design. 
I think that the right way to do is to mix to make really mix mix mode uh, surveys and really to uh, focus on the experimental design because with experimental design we can really with a sh with a, um, a short um, a short um, number of, of, of observation of projects we can we can really um, make strong conclusions so we within the, and from my point of view we have to go in this area of the experimental design and um, also to uh, improve the participatory formats uh, relate to help the, the actors I mean the stakeholders and the, uh, to integrate the knowledge and the methods in in a cooperative um, I mean um, in a cooperative um, way of doing to really to integrate this Energy Partage is doing that. It's trying to integrating the, 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 the renewable energy communities and projects and to help them to understand what is an evaluation and how they can really uh, integrate the evaluation in their process in the way to do that. It's really important, I think. Yes, that's it. Thank you very much, Dorian. Uh, I think it was really uh, an an amazing presentation and full of uh, material and uh, very useful for our own work as well. And then uh, one, some of the points that you mentioned were already mentioned uh, by previous speakers, which is just a, a confirmation of how uh, key points these are. Uh, so you were uh, totally on top on the on the uh, to the point. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, now we'll uh, move to. Um, Ms. Esther van der Waal, uh, who is a postdoc at Dutch, uh, the University of Groningen, and she will share her expertise on the intersection between social and technical innovation by local energy initiatives. Um, well, thank you also for your very helpful um, uh, paper and the material you have shared in your contributions. I think that you don't have a presentation, so we can uh, begin, right? Yes, yeah, thank you very much for inviting me to give my perspective on uh, the assessment of social impact of community energy. Uh, I indeed have no slides, I just want to share uh, some experiences that I have with you from various projects and um, yeah, share some discussion points. So I will do it based on my notes. And um, yeah, I want to apologize in advance that I'm uh, very far in my pregnancy. Sometimes I may be a little bit out of breath. So. I hope I don't get too uh, energetic and forget to talk, but um, yeah. Um, so I will give more of a broader overview on uh, social uh, impact assessment from um, yeah my perspective as an academic. So I will go into um, yeah the following topics. So how do I see social impact uh, and its assessment? Uh, what are possible impact categories that you can assess? Um, and I will share some um, experiences uh, from the projects uh, that I was involved in that assess social impacts in uh, different ways. Um, and um, yeah, that delves a little bit into um, yeah, what kind of skill can you use for social impact assessment and what kind of focus can you take? And then, um, yeah, I want to cover some difficulties in measuring impact. Um, Dorian was also already going into that, so I hope I can supplement it there a little bit more. Um, yeah, and a little conclusion on what the impact is of uh, community energy. So to start, um, yeah, how do I see uh, social impact and its assessment? So I mostly use um, the definitions of the International Association for Impact Assessment. I find them very helpful because they're quite broad and they leave a lot of space um, yeah, for your own operationalization of impact categories. So they see um, social impact assessment as the processes of analyzing, monitoring and uh, managing the intended and the unintended social consequences and both negative and positive of planned interventions, such as in this case, uh, energy projects by community groups and um, any social change processes evoked or invoked by these interventions. So, and then impacts um, are defined as um, all the issues related to planned intervention that can affect or concern people directly or indirectly, perceptual or corporeal. So that means that um, 
Also, if it's a perception of impact, so something that cannot really, um, yeah, be seen in in practice. That's more um, in the minds of people. So maybe some potential health effects of turbines, for example, they're much debated, cannot really um, be demonstrated that they are there, but um, some people do experience them that would then also count as a social impact in um, this definition. Um, yeah, so my research on social impact started in 2015. It was actually with Anna, who is also here today. So that's nice to see. And um, uh, I was looking at some uh, impact categories. So um, I did some field work on a very small island in Scotland, Shepinsey, which has about 300 inhabitants. So that makes impact assessment there quite easy because uh, the borders of the islands are very clear. So the delineation of your community um, on which you want to uh, assess the impact is also um, yeah, rather obvious. And it was only 300 people. So um, yeah, that small wind scheme that was developed there had quite a demonstrable uh, impact. But um, as a first step, I did some um, literature review and um, yeah, found several categories of impact that I would like to share with you now. So one is uh, local economic uh, development. So project induced uh, income, jobs and services. A second is the reduction of energy costs and fuel poverty. Third, um, the development of knowledge and skills. So this is mostly by the people who uh, develop the project. They, in the process, uh, develop some skills regarding the development of renewable energy. Um, furthermore, I saw that um, there were some um, effects on social cohesion in the community, both positive and negative, because um, developing a project jointly can uh, unite people, but it can also divide them. Um, as community energy groups are also uh, focused on uh, sharing knowledge uh, on renewable energy. Uh, there can also be seen some uh, effects on energy literacy, energy related behavioral uh, change as a consequence and the local uh, support for renewable energy. But there can also be more negative effects like um, impacts on the livability of an area, uh, impacts on uh, health and safety impacts of, on the nature and area and the landscape. So um, yeah, it's not only um, positive uh, outcomes that can be uh, found when you do such an assessment. I think sometimes that's really forgotten because this community um, notion has a very positive connotation, but uh, also when an energy project is a community energy project, it can still cause uh, yeah, division in the community or um, create negative landscape effects, for example. So that was a very um, localized project. I worked there with the local community um, and assessed these uh, impact categories, found that most of the, the really demonstrable concrete social impacts were related to the revenues from the renewable energy project from the wind energy project because it, it yielded some funds that could be invested in the community, for example, for a community bus, uh, for out of hours ferry service. Um, but what I also found was that this method was very hard to scale because it was very time intensive. So you would like to do it for many communities or focus groups, do surveys there. Um, yeah, it would also be quite a burden for the communities as Dorian already discussed in the previous presentation. So um, yeah, there are definitely, definitely also different ways to go about things. Um, I'm now involved um, in uh, Horizon 2020 project, Comets, and there um, we take sort of the opposite approach. We um, do an international survey covering six different countries. We have about 260 um, yeah, collective action initiatives, so community energy initiatives that uh, responded from the Netherlands, Belgium, uh, Estonia, Poland, Spain, and Italy. And um, here we also looked at um, non-energy related impacts. And um, 
yeah, found that quite some community energy groups focused on the, uh, what we here call social impact. So we found that 43% uh, had undertaken civil society mobilization activities. Such activities include, for example, making political recommendations and lobbying uh, participation campaigns. And 62% um, of the um, respondents uh, were involved in social uh, activities, uh, furthering social goals like uh, supporting local projects. It was the most uh, prevalent one, but also empowering youth, uh, social inclusion of all genders, support of individuals. And um, of course, also a large share demonstrated knowledge and skills development. To a much lesser extent, we found that um, groups were undertaking uh, activities to protect or improve the quality of uh, the living environment. There were, for example, activities related to waste treatment, uh, community gardening. Um, and the nice thing about this study compared to the other study was that you can really identify patterns and see the figures, but uh, less so than in the previous study that I mentioned, you cannot really um, get to the explanations. You would then need to take the step from uh, seeing the patterns. So for example, in the Netherlands, there um, is, it's mostly investment oriented. Uh, and uh, yeah, the main social impact is by investing in community projects but there are not really many uh, environmental care activities. Yeah, why is that the case? And why do Spanish and um, Italian cooperatives um, undertake such activities that we in the Netherlands don't? Yeah, you don't really know that after such a survey. So it's far less time consuming for um, the cooperative, but you also get to less explanations. So it's really, um, yeah, a different approach. Uh, and then the last uh, approach to social impact um, that I have some experience with and I want to share with you is, um, I think what was close to what most people presented. So a focus on a specific part of social impact. Um, and uh, I'm now undertaking a study with a colleague that's focusing on social business models. And that's then specifically focusing on um, financial inclusion in the energy transition because cooperatives aim to be very open and um, inclusive, but um, in the end, at least in the Netherlands, many projects are based on financial participation. So then not only knowledge and time can be, um, yeah, something that hinders participation, but in this case also money. And um, yeah, here we found some business models that made, um, yeah, cooperative enterprising more accessible for, lower income households. But at the same time, we found that, um, yeah, these initiatives helped, but um, yeah, they, they increased uh, the equity. But still we saw that um, people with less capital to invest also reap less benefits and to some extent that's logical. So you can lower the threshold, but if you invest less, then you also get less return. Um, so that's also, uh, a way you can go about social impact assessment. Um, and some difficulties that, uh, yeah, I already raised some, but some difficulties I found in measuring impact is uh, whether you want to aim at the community organization, um, its participants or the wider community, because mostly only uh, people from the community organization are uh, asked for the impacts and their activities but um, you would get a much more representative uh, and yeah, more complete view of what the impact is when you would ask people who are not directly involved and have maybe um, less of a rosy view on community energy. And um, yeah, experience it as one of the things that are happening in their community. So, but if you want to uh, include people from the community, your research expands like a lot because of what percentage should you include? Um, is it too burdensome for the community? Does the community energy initiative want this? Um, yeah, because I think they should also give consent for it because maybe not every organization wants you to go into the community and ask what they really feel about your organization. So that can be a little bit sensitive. 
And um, yeah, also the part about that is very time consuming to take this um, method, I think is a challenge for social impact assessment. And I was thinking about some ways to go about it. And I think consortium research is one of the ways. Because for example, in this uh, Commons Consortium that I was talking about, we are already collaborating with uh, six uh, countries, with partners from six countries. But I think it could even be a little bit broader because um, community energy groups get so many surveys and it's really burning them. And um, yeah, mostly they're focusing on doing, not on um, being part of research. So I think more collaboration here could be part of the answer. Um, yeah, and in some countries, maybe not so much of a problem because they already do uh, their own impact assessments for um, yeah, grant applications and reporting. Um, and um, yeah, then it's more part of their own uh, process. I think another way um, that we see in the Netherlands, at least, is that the national uh, platform for community energy initiatives, uh, in this case, here opgewekt, um, is collecting information, but then it's very limited not to overburden these communities. So then uh, you might not get the information you would need for um, in-depth research. Yeah, so that's a brief overview of um, my experience with social impact. And yeah, I would like to leave it here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Esther. And um, I think you raised some uh, very positive issues and you, uh, significant issues. And you gave us also your practical feedback, which is really, really helpful for us. And I think that uh, you have a question also in the chat. Uh, maybe you would like to share uh, some links to the surveys or the or, or the work that you have mentioned because I think it would be very helpful for for everyone attending the workshop. And um, I think that we can now and thank you also and congrats for the the new member coming <laughs> very soon. Uh, we can now move on. I think uh, with um, Mr. Christian Weinzer. Uh, uh, to share his approach on quantifying the social impact as it was developed in the context of the SONET project, that is a, an EU Horizon 2020 program. Uh, welcome. Thank you very much. And uh, the technical question as the start, since I'm presenting an updated slide deck, can you see my screen? We can see it perfectly. It's, it's okay, great. perfect. Thank you. All right. So, um, yeah, then let me start quickly. Um, what did we measure uh, at the SONET project? Um, we measured the contribution of a diverse type uh, of many different types of SIE initiatives. So I'm not going to go through this typology here. You will find it in one of the deliverables. I just highlighted the relevant part for you in red because I think this uh, conference uh, is focused on cooperative energy production. And by the way, I need to excuse for coming late because I had to present at the previous conference just until about half an hour ago. So yes, uh, apologies for not capturing all the discussion before, um, but we did assess the impact of cooperative energy production as one of the social initiatives uh, types that we had. We assessed the impact of these uh, social initiatives um, on a number of different aims, and some of them I've heard during the previous uh, discussions. So uh, things like uh, the local community or quality of life, and uh, you will see all the aims listed here. Some of them, as I understand, are in the focus of this uh, conference. They are social aims, uh, but others are also outside of the scope. So uh, things like um, energy consumption, energy efficiency, which are the typical EU aims. Um, and uh, I'm afraid that for us in the work package, the major focus had been, in, in fact, to assess the impact on these EU aims. So uh, the social aims are a byproduct, you will see, because we also have answers on these, but we did not go in as much depth on the social aims as we did on the EU aims. Now, what approach did we choose for measuring these impacts in the work package six? Um, we basically used these various surveys, it kind of reminds me to what Dorian mentioned, um, a variety of different surveys to get different uh, perspectives. We were planning to use one survey which was answered by researchers, representatives from these organizations, and also, as Esther mentioned, field actors that are not directly members of the organizations, but independent third parties. 
And the first survey consisted in what we can get very easily, which is Likert scale ratings. You see a screenshot below how that may have looked. For instance, here's a list of the policy of the aims you may wish. And then we asked people, you know, what do you think? What was the effect which this organization, it would then always be the name of a concrete organization in each survey, um, has had on uh, each of these aims. And so people provided a five-point Likert scale uh, rating, or four, rather four-point Likert scale ratings for each effect. And uh, one small difference is uh, for usually the researchers and representatives we asked concerning a concrete initiative, whereas for the field actors, we asked them for a field as a whole. Uh, the rationale behind that was to test whether maybe when we look at a field as a whole, there are some uh, field effects so that the group, the sum of all is more than, uh, you know, the sum of each individual impact. Um, we then wanted to triangulate that with uh, more objective data regarding um, the uh, impact on, in particular, the EU aims, where we wanted to collect data regarding, for instance, how many kilowatt uh, PV they installed, how many uh, tons of CO2 emissions they saved, and so on. And then in a third uh, survey, we were planning to survey the members from the SIE initiatives um, regarding subjective impacts which the initiative had had on them. What's the rationale behind that? Our thinking was that, well, an initiative may impact various stages of the decision-making process. It can start with making people aware of something. It can convince them of something. It can tell them how to take an action or actually make them take an action on something. And so we had a Likert scale rating ex with exactly those steps where each member could tell, well, for each of these aims, the initiative made me aware of this, convinced me, made me take an action. And um, this would help us to discover effects which could take place before an actual tangible effect in terms of renewables installed was happening. And the idea there was maybe in some countries, you know, people are not yet convinced of certain aims. So you create a pre-impact which later on um, may help a policy to translate into a smartly measurable impact, objectively measurable impact. So. I still like the design very, very much. Uh, the unfortunate news is if you look at the results we got uh, in terms of response rates, uh, it doesn't look good. Um, uh, that may be partly due to our recruitment strategy. I think we need to take some blame here and for the next projects, it, you may do this better. Um, so you're free to use these surveys if you want. I will publish them if you, you can adapt and use whatever you want there. Um, but it, in, essentially, it meant we could only evaluate the first survey. Um, I'll be really, really brief regarding the results because we mainly evaluated for EU aims, which I take are not the focus here, um, just in terms of the high level messages you get. Um, the highest contribution was by um, a certain type of SIE initiative. So if you go back to this typology we had, you know, we, we, uh, categorized them according to the, you know, whether the activity was something where they did something, they influenced the thinking or influenced the organizing, and also regarding the relation they had, whether it was cooperation, exchange, competition, or conflict. And certain of these types um, had a statistically significantly higher um, impact. We controlled in the analysis, if you see, uh, we controlled for who provided the rating. Uh, so first of all, you know, for what type of aim it was. And uh, unsurprisingly, the SIE aims, so those which were not shared by the EU, you may say many of these are the social aims, which achieved a somewhat higher contribution rating, half a point on the Likert scale than the EU aims. And last but not least, depending on who you asked, whether you asked field actors or the other two, the field actors had a slightly higher contribution rating for whichever reason we suspect it's a bias because if you check the contribution rating it's significantly higher but then if you also include the importance rating we ask the same question as we have on the left also regarding the importance of different aims the importance ra rating was also higher for these actors so if you include it as a predictor then suddenly the contribution rating itself vanishes that sort of seems to indicate that they just simply consistently ranked higher both the importance and the contribution and so i can't really say 
that um, yeah they capture something like field effects. So that's the high level summary. What problems did we face? I already mentioned the low response rate by initiatives. Um, then also data quality biases, both because of this, what you see with the field actors, they may have some bias, but also regarding the smart data that they may have. We conducted some follow-up interviews, what smart data they may have. Um, it's not a lot, but it's measured in different ways. Um, and then even if you get the smart data, even if it is uh, unbiased, you still have the problem that the initiatives are so diverse. In our case, it's really hard to compare them. Maybe if you only focus on energy cooperatives, it's easier to normalize. You can just uh, normalize by the number of members or by the you know annual budget, whatever. In our case, we had um, initiatives which were um, like financing mechanisms where the member is just someone giving money and initiatives which were networks of city council where the member is a whole town. And you can imagine the impacts were an order of magnitude different and then how shall you normalize you can't normalize by the number of members so it's really hard to compare in our case and then at the last point even if you took care of this there are still a large number of potential influencing factors um, the high contribution in terms of renewables installed may be caused not at all because of the initiative it may be caused because simply the rules are different in one country and i think the same could also be true for the social impact so there are a large number of factors that you don't control for which can all influence the result and that makes it very hard to interpret if you want to be statistically significant so what other approaches did we then uh, come up in the end because of the low server response rates we agreed to brainstorm a number of other uh, measurement approaches and that's going to be my last slide um, we uh, were introduced from some colleagues at our university to discourse analysis what is that in a nutshell you automatically download a large number and by large i'm talking about terabytes of um, data from news archives from websites you can crawl the whole internet um, you can take confidential reports from organizations if, if you have access whatever you can use twitter, twitter profiles anything and you can use machine learning to distill relevant information from that. The main advantage we have here is obviously that you have the same method for any organization. So in that sense, it is a comparable that takes care at least of the data quality bias issue, because to some extent you have the same measurement, uh, you know, basis for all of the initiatives. Um, um, of course, you still have the remaining problems here that the diversity of initiatives makes it hard to compare and so on and the influencing factors that doesn't help with that, but at least the first two problems you can uh, solve. Um, and if you want to know more about this uh, tool, you can uh, free to contact the person that I mentioned here, Mr. Peter Stücheli Hertach, he'll be very happy to help in case of future projects that you're keen on engaging. The second uh, tool that we identified as being potentially helpful was regarding was a database from the European Energy Award. I'm not sure how many of you are aware of this, but they have a huge database covering the countries that you see here, and they do um, report a lot of um, uh, interesting impacts, at least for us, they were interesting because it's many impacts related to, to EU aims. I'm afraid, again, that's not the social impacts, but um, they may also include some social impacts um, you would need to verify. Um, one challenge here is that the information they have from different countries is often in forms of text files. So for them, it's really hard to interpret meaningfully, but that's where the tool on the left could come in handy because you have a lot of text files and you have tools for interpreting them. And so you, again, you could choose, uh, combine the two to uh, analyze the impact of different social initiatives, uh, social innovations, um, on whichever metrics they have included here. So here you would need to check with them. And again, if you look the contact details, it was Miss Charlotte Spernley. She'll be very happy um, to assist with projects in this area. That is all from my side. I hope I made it on the time and I'm now looking at the chat if there are any questions. Hello, thank you. I think you are pretty much in the time, yes. Uh, thank you for that again. Uh, um, yes, there is a point uh, from Dorian, he would like to be in touch in general with everybody, uh, so I think we, we can manage that as long as we have your mm. written consent to share your email, For sure. so that you can, uh, the, the exchange can go on uh, further in the future. Uh, this is uh, something that we will try also to 
uh, instigate ourselves to to uh, create more opportunities to get back uh, with you and to share more about your projects and the process the process of our project uh, on uh, measuring the social impact and raising awareness over the social impact of energy communities. Um, I don't see an actual question, I think. So uh, thank you, uh, Christian. And we can go on with um, uh, our last uh, speaker for the day. Uh, this is Anna Berka. Uh, uh, thank Hi, Anna. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. I will just share my screen if that's all right. Yeah, Anna uh, is presenting from New Zealand. She's a lecturer and academic uh, consultant at Massey University, and uh, she works on effective climate change governance in relation to risk, inclusivity, and innovation, uh, using country comparative studies to draw lessons for policy and practice. And uh, it's really a pleasure uh, and honor to have you here from from this bottom right corner of the world, as you mentioned in your presentation. Uh, thank you very much. It's been very interesting uh, just to listen to you. And it makes me realize how, how fast um, this, this field is evolving, right? Both in terms of research and, and practice as well. Uh, please excuse my, my early morning face. Um, try not to look at me in the slides perhaps. <laughs> um, so, um, at this point in, in today's webinar, uh, I feel like we, we all have a really good understanding of what social impacts are, why they're important, right? You talked quite a bit about methods. So, so I thought maybe I'd just take a step back and give a local perspective on the, on the back of some work I've been doing both at the university and, and with uh, uh, the, the, the energy implementing agency here called ICA, right? the Energy uh, uh, Efficiency Authority. So uh, just very briefly, in, in the domestic context here, we have uh, a policy and regulatory context that has historically focused on large scale hydropower. And then that was complemented over time with coal and gas. So there have been, uh, because of that, really, there have been no systematic policy strategies at all to support decentralized um, energy. So, for example, if you are an independent power generator here, and you have no rights to connect to the grid, uh, you would have to trade directly on the wholesale market or uh, manage somehow to get a, a power purchase deal from a generator retailer. But if you have a small project, they're generally just not, not so interested, right? So the only um, community energy we have here at the moment are shared ownership geothermal projects between indigenous Maori trusts and utilities. And so the Maori trusts are often landowners in these projects and also a whole bunch of self-consumption projects, um, right? For obvious reasons. Uh, and we're also now starting to see one or two local energy market type, type projects that, that have come up uh, today already uh, because they have these clear benefits for the for, for local DNO. So you might think now, well, what's the problem, right? You've, you've got a you've got a clean you've got clean clean electricity. Uh, there's there's no issue here, but. Uh, you know, in lieu of emerging opportunities around demand side management, we've got transport electrification that will uh, require us to supply more renewable electricity in future. We've got lots of ongoing issues around energy security being quite poor on low voltage grids in rural areas here. We've got high retail prices, really high because of collusion on the wholesale market in what is basically an oligopoly, right? So there's market capture there. So we've got a centralized system that's, that's under pressure. Um, and uh, of course, in the future, going to the future, we've also got increasing reliance on coal and gas. We're already starting to see this because of the climate change impacts on our hydro reservoirs, right? So there's now signs of sort of small windows of opportunity for more inclusive uh, decentralized uh, uh, developments. Um, now, uh, so having sort of sat within government, <laughs> um, there are a number of reasons why social impacts continue to be overlooked, right? And for example, why it's so difficult to, 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 to garner support just uh, sort of for, for programs that, that support pro uh, community energy projects here. And so I feel like these social impacts tend tend to fall through the cracks of the system um, and, and have, have been for, for quite some time. And I think part of the reason for that is just that it's really hard. I think I think it's clear from, from the presentations today, right? So ultimately all impacts are social, right? And so in the ideal setting where you have the resources to do it properly, you'd be using integrated frameworks that can account for your social change processes, your, your, your human impacts, right? In relation to those biophysical and, and also economic impacts. And, and, um, 
uh, so that you can start understanding those social processes and causal mechanisms and flow on effects. And so, and so from that respect, I think we really need to stay clear from checklist type, type studies or, or frameworks like MCDA that are used here sometimes uh, that, that sort of segregate, com compartmentalize between the social environment, economic, and, and that don't generate those insights, right, between, your, uh, between those different dimensions. Um, and, the, and so the other thing is that at the moment, um, uh, the methods are out there, uh, but they're not well established, certainly not well utilized in the public sector at all. So here in New Zealand, they use basically CBA, right, to, to basically capture these direct benefits and costs. Uh, occasionally, you might see a, an MCDA being used and that would, would capture some of these co-benefits and transaction costs. Um, but whereas I feel like uh, some of these Integrated methods, and I think Esther, you, you're you're referring to this in, in your presentation as well, uh, has much more potential to capture all of these benefits, uh, uh, all of these impacts. My, my, is what I meant. Um, so I feel like we can actually learn uh, from this long-standing tradition of SIA. But because of the history, very particular history of that field, right, a lot of that, that work has focused on ameliorating negative impacts of mining and infrastructure projects. So it requires a bit of um, adapting. Um, the other, um, I guess, observation I've had from working here is that uh, it, overlooking social impact is also very much a matter of worldview. So, so the public sector and the regulator here is dominated by basically a utilitarian view, right? That the only criteria for public spending is how we can how we can mitigate emissions at the lowest cost for the whole country, irrespective of what co-benefits might occur, right? In the form of regional development, community impacts, potential flow on effects, all the things we've we've heard about uh, today already, uh, and, and also in terms of. Uh, possible spin-off effects that we've heard about right in terms of empowering future uh, community action on the back of some of these projects that, that can generate revenues and and inspire people to to, to go on and, and um, you know uh, pursue a whole bunch of other public educational environmental projects locally so uh, I'm a keen contender of the, of the of these of these integrated methods but at the same time um, I really think we need to remember that ultimately, your, your approach to evaluation needs to be informed by what you want to know, and it needs to be feasible, right? Um, practitioners, we've heard, have real resource constraints. Many are overstudied, we've heard. So, uh, but they, they will want to know things like, are, you know, is their project working well? Uh, how user-friendly is the technology? Are they targeting the right people we've heard today? So uh, are they having the intended impacts on well-being? So whereas we as a researcher might for a completely different purpose of, of asking, for example, is there a case for community energy? I uh, want to take account of regional economic impacts, for example. So that's why I like these, these guiding principles, right? Just as a reminder of, uh, you know, is, is what we're doing fit for purpose? And finally, I know it's been a really long session, so I'm gonna keep this really short. Um, uh, so this is some work that came off the back, partly of the, the work we, we did with Esther back in Scotland. Um, as we know, uh, we've heard from Christian too, energy communities, they come in all shapes and sizes. Diverse technology, skills of deployment, finance, ownership, delivery models, uh, motivations, functional activities, all of that will, will shape ultimately what, what those impacts will be. So uh, I guess the main takeaway from, from the reviews that we've been doing is um, it is possible to generalize between your type of project, right, and uh, uh, and 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 what potential impacts are going to be generated by by that type of projects, um, and if, and then in keeping in mind, we've heard I think um, it was Daniela Pachi who talked about barriers. So I've I've called them preconditions here, right? So depending on your leadership, right, uh, locally. Um, and and <clears throat> how homogeneous the interests are, you, you know, you, you might see a project having positive or negative impacts on social capital. So we just had a, our only wind project here, community wind owned project, uh, where the 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 leading the leading person has received death threats, and it's completely polarized the, the community. And ultimately, of course, the project fell flat on its face. Right. So that's a kind of a um, an example of how those preconditions can uh, influence what what impacts ultimately uh, end up being materialized. 
right? So by the same token, I feel um, it's really important for us to take in, to, into account, uh, you know, the unique context of, of each project on a case by case basis. Uh, so that we can see are these pre preconditions being met without generalizing and extrapolating uh, of what impacts of community energy may be right Acro across projects. So I'll, I think I might just keep it there. I've got my email at the back of the of the slide. I've already got my croaky voice. Uh, I just wanted to say I found it um, uh, absolutely expert facilitation today as well. Uh, so uh, thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Anna. And I think this is really uh, very important to hear from you because you have uh, some extra pressure. <laughs> the time uh, uh, time zone, for example, is one thing. And I, I really enjoyed your presentation and your, your input there. I think it's very helpful for everybody here to hear the perspective, uh, your perspective. Um, I don't I don't see that we have a question. And uh, so then I will try a bit to, to summarize some key points I gathered. Uh, first of all, uh, measuring social impact, it's really hard. We can all understand uh, a bit about social impact or we have a feeling about social impact of energy communities and there is research and there are projects uh, in investigating this topic, but this is, um, this is not something very clear and this is where we would like to uh, work uh, to, to cover this gap uh, in collaboration with you, of course. Thank you for your contributions. I see that this is a, there was a energy poverty and energy communities. Uh, uh, energy poverty and energy communities was really uh, closely mentioned a lot of times when it comes to social impact. Uh, on the one hand, because energy communities could also uh, could help in the energy mitigation, but uh, also negatively in a way, how can we uh, make energy communities more accessible to energy uh, vulnerable citizens without compromising uh, the, their business model and uh, their sustainability financial wise. Um, the spin-off effects of uh, energy communities as a social impact uh, and the engagement of the community and citizens uh, within uh, these networks and their, their works was really uh, mentioned a lot of times as well. Um, I wouldn't like to take much more of, of the time because I, I know that we have a question uh, that is from uh, Dimitris Kitsikopoulos and uh, I would like you, Dimitri, to, yes. Hi. to address it to uh, Mr. Hadzi Argiriu, I think it yes, is. Yes, if he's still with us because I understand we have been talking for a long long time so i understand <laughs> everybody is quite tired uh, and uh, all the information that was uh, shared uh, is uh, very was very useful today and uh, the insights were really amazing uh yeah i have a a question for mr hazir Giriu that has to do with uh, uh, the access to the grid and the ownership of the grid uh, by uh, energy communities um I know it is a topic that is not uh, very well known, but uh, yeah, according to the um, um, legislation in Greece, energy communities have the right to uh, get part of the ownership of local uh, grids. The question is, uh, according to his expertise, does he think that this is something uh, feasible, uh, knowing the Greek context? Also, does he think it is something helpful uh, for, for the grid itself? Will it make it better? I understand that uh, for the, the realization of community energy projects, it might be useful, but uh, yeah, th that's the question. And if there are, because there are many things that energy communities can do from, um, uh, from um, uh, energy production, energy saving, uh, demand response, storage, electric mobility. Is it grid ownership and grid um, um, projects should be also at their um, uh, agendas or is it something we should skip for now? I know it's not, it's, yeah, yeah, please. That's a difficult question. I think that uh, in the Greek context that we have always had the uh, one uh, uh, one uh, distribution company that serves the whole of Greece. It's quite difficult for energy community to take ownership 
of the network and to operate the network because the technical complication is quite high. The economies of scale do not favor such an approach. And uh, so I have quite strong uh, concerns about the economic feasibility of such an attempt. It has never happened in Greece. The only perhaps case we have in Greece, I don't know if you know, is the microgrid of Hydromandra. This is a microgrid of uh, uh, 12 houses that has built its own network because they were, this is in Kithnos, and they have built their own network following the standards of PPC. And uh, this was helped, in fact, by the local PPC personnel, but they, it was the first, perhaps, very small uh, attempt to have their own network. Um, I really doubt about the economic feasibility of such an approach of having policy. This is perhaps uh, much more uh, suitable for countries like Germany that have many, many, you know, many hundreds or thousands of institutions uh, operators. In fact, there are villages or small towns that are themselves distribution system operators. But in Greece, we don't have this experience. There is a lot of technical knowledge needed for safety issues, and etc. And also the building and the maintenance of this network is not straightforward and not cost effective. Because again, I said, you miss the economies of scale for, uh, um, uh, you know, for the procuring of the equipment, etc. So that's that's what I think. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Hadzir Giril. And um, I think we have another question coming from uh, Chris Vretos. Uh, and uh, maybe you would like to address it to Ms. Anna Berka. Uh, yeah, Anna, thanks a lot for the great presentation and for uh, joining us from down under today. You know, it's like very early there. So special thanks for that. Uh, I was wondering, you said that, um, so there's an oligopoly in uh, the energy market in New Zealand. So I was wondering if you've seen studies from, uh, I don't know, other countries or have kind of from, through your own research drawn kind of like a causal uh, relationship between the number of energy communities or like prosumers uh, that can are found in a, in a national grid in any country and how that affects uh, market prices. So when we have more players participating, does that lead to lower prices? So countering the oligopoly that you were talking about before. Well, it's it's a complicated, right? Price is ultimately quite complicated because it's a, a function of many things. But um, I think what is very clear from the literature that we have or from the various countries is that when you have an oligopoly, you have market capture happening, that these players have disproportionate power over ultimately over policy decisions. And that's the point where, right, be because energy communities are so dependent on an enabling policy context, I think that's where um where the, where the key is right um does that i know that doesn't directly answer your question but um you know in terms of if you obviously if you if you opened up the market and created more competition yeah and you know absolutely the prices go down um but prices are also a function of so many other things so uh, so Yeah, no, I, I understand it. I mean, we've already said countless times, even within this workshop, that many times it's very hard to, to draw these causal uh, lines between the impacts and the effects on the ground. So, yeah, but... Uh, you, I, can, I, you can really, you can see it back in the narratives, right? When you look at the kind of policy documents, um, you know, uh, and we have a regulator here and they have, they have, two, they have two goals and it's, uh, it's basically, it's cost. Right, and it's energy energy security, and they don't take uh, orders from the from the Minister of Energy even. So um, yeah, a highly conservative, um, small organization, very resource constrained as well. How do you get them to start to open up to some of these some of these co benefits and some of these other other reasons for for supporting projects like this? It's it's proven really hard. Thank you. Thank you. 
thank you very much, uh, Anna. Thank you all for for being uh, here with us until the end. Well, some for some of you it was really difficult. Others uh, may not so much. But for us, it was really a pleasure and an honor to have you here. And we will definitely uh, keep in touch uh, with you in order to learn more about what you have been uh, up to regarding the social impact of energy communities, the topic that we have discussed, and also to share how our project is progressing. And um, uh, thank you again and have a nice day, Anna. Have a good evening, <laughs> everybody else. Thank you. <laughs>